reporting. Uh, we got someone or something crawling around out here. Did you see what it was? Was it a person or an animal or? I can't tell. All I know is that my central light came on and I just happened to glimpse and see this thing running across the yard. Uh, a good sized man or something looks like a man. I don't know what it was, just it, it ran across the yard. Okay. You've had problems in the neighborhood before? Yeah, my dog was killed here just recently. I don't know what it was, whatever it is, it's running. I couldn't catch it if I was going to chase it. So whatever it was, it was standing up. I'm out here looking through the window now and I don't see anything. I don't want to go outside. Jesus Christ, you better... Sure. See ya. Hello. Get somebody out here. What's going on now, sir? That son of a bitch is about six foot nine. I don't know. Do you see him now, sir? Yes. You're listening to Paranormal 411. Coming to you live from an undisclosed location deep within the Appalachian Mountains, bringing you the unknown with your hosts David Reagan and Jason Scott, Paranormal 411. All right, welcome. Welcome, everybody. We're back. Another great show, another great night. How you doing, Jason? Uh, I'm doing pretty good. Did you have a good week? Yeah, it was okay. Was it? I had a pretty decent week this week. Can't say <laughs> can't say I had a bad one. So it was it was good. We uh we worked hard this week. <laughs> really? Yeah, I worked hard. I had to, a lot of work to do this week. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so um, what's been going on? Oh, just working. That's about it. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> hey, mm. uh. We uh we got a great show tonight coming up. We do. We do. Uh we got a Tennessee guy, Tennessee boy here. Oh yeah, we're going to learn have some get to learn about some Middle Tennessee uh hauntings and stuff, which is pretty fantastic. Yeah, Alan Searcy, I think I'm pronouncing his last name right. Uh he's an author of several books uh i think it's like five i think uh, i think there's more than that I, th- I don't think he just authors these i think there's a lot more but uh he's the author of southern ghost stories series uh that's what we're gonna be talking about tonight yeah, it's out in middle tennessee mostly so we're we're neighbors yep <clears throat> and i want to hear um you know his take a little bit on uh on some Stuff that we've been wanting to go do, uh, you know, so oh. that's up in his neck of the woods. So yeah. I think that'll be fun getting to talk about. And mm-hmm. um, he has some really good stories, you know, some stories about the, um, uh, what is that, the um, Grand Ole Opry or the Opry? Yeah, I, I've been wanting to talk. I, I want to ask him about the Opry, yeah. see if uh, what kind of stories people's been telling. Yeah. He has a really good story. I didn't. I didn't know the history um, about the Opry, uh, Grand Ole Opry or Opryland, um, until he said I didn't. Know, I didn't understand, and and I won't say anything because I want him to tell the story. But um, I didn't understand. Didn't know what it was before. Well, Opryland used to be a theme park, right? But before it was a theme park, it was something else. Oh, and that. And I, I've been there. Was it? Did you? In fact. Uh, the day that we went, somebody on, I think it was called the Cannonball, uh, one of the workers got killed. Wow. Yeah. They closed the park? Uh, yeah. Wow. At least they closed that ride down for sure. But that I was probably yeah, eight or ten years street. old. I wonder if there's a haunting because of that. Maybe. Maybe he knows about it. That would be cool. Huh. So uh, before we get into... Uh, uh, the, uh, the show, we have to do a little, uh, this day in history with David Reagan. Well, thank you, Jason. Oh, you're welcome. So this day in history in 1768, Encyclopedia Britannica first published. So the first part of the first edition of the Encyclopedia, uh, Encyclopedia Britannica. Let me see if I can say this right. The oldest continuously published and revised work in the English language was published and advertised for sale in Edinburgh on this day 
in 1768. Ah. Also, one more. On this day in 2007, Argentine po- uh, politician Cristina Fernandez uh, de Kirchner was sworn into office as Argentina's first female elected president. And huh. she was succeeded by her husband. And that was just a few of the things that happened this day on in history. What's today's date? I don't know. What is it? The day <laughs> the is 10th, the 10th. The 10th well, of December. 10th. Yes. 2000 and grand great 21. <laughs> Wait till 22, right? Oh, yeah. Hey, we want to welcome Bird Dog in the chat room. What's up, Bird Dog? How you doing? What's up? We got someone, guest 61, in there, too. Oh, yeah. So, uh, I'm not seeing you in there, Jason. I'm not logged in. So. Oh, so you're guest 61. Uh, maybe. <laughs> I guess I need to hey. log in. Yeah. Well, um, go ahead. So uh, we're going to go to a very quick break, and then we're going to bring on our guest, Mr. Alan Searcy. Searcy. Uh, and he's going to talk to us about some hauntings over in uh, Middle Tennessee. What do you I think? Love it. Yes, it's going to be it's going to be great. It's going to be a great show. I wonder if he knows anything about the Ryman. Have you ever heard of the Ryman Theater? It's where a lot of uh, country musicians and stuff got their start. Really? Yeah. Hmm. I don't know. I've heard it was haunted. I bet. I bet there's a lot of stuff up through there. Because like he said, you know, there's several battles and stuff that was fought up yeah. through there too. So That's one of the big things about uh, Middle Tennessee is they did have a lot of skirmishes and battles in the civil war yeah so i i'd say that there's quite a bit up there that's going on for sure all right uh, we're going to take a little quick break all right remember we are simulcasting on podbean and on spreaker and uh, you could also come to paranormal411.org and come in and um, check us out listen to the show live chat with us in the chat room and um you're listening to uh Paranormal 411, your hosts are David and Jason. We'll be back right after these messages. Thanks for listening to the show. You can find us on Facebook and Twitter at Paranormal 411. Join us on the website at Paranormal411.org. It's free to sign up and become a member. All of our upcoming shows are on the guest and events page. You can also listen to past shows on the website as well. And if you like the show and want to support us, you can do that by becoming a premium member for only $2 a month. Thanks for listening to Paranormal 411. Join us. This is Jeff Reagan of the band Catalyst. Visit Paranormal 411. Click on our link on the right-hand side to listen to or purchase any of our albums on BandLab. In a world on the edge of oblivion, go to Paranormal411.org for all of your paranormal, extraterrestrial, and cryptid needs.
right, we're back after that short little break. Nice little break. Um, and uh, remember that um, the uh, band Catalyst allows us to play all their music, and um, we we definitely appreciate them for that. And uh, if you like it, definitely um, go to paranormal411.org over on the right hand side of the home page. There, when you first come in, uh, you could see their link and and go go click on it. And go to Band Labs, and you could listen to all the music you want and, and download it and. And purchase it. Oh, um, yeah. Hey, definitely you, check them out. I got a question for you. Yeah. Have you had a monster drink or something? Because you're talking like this. I haven't. <laughs> but, you know, um, I'll tell you, today, um, I have been upstairs. You can see it after it's done. Because Jason knows uh, I've recently started a business. Oh, yeah. And so we were setting up the home office upstairs today. So I've been up there slaving away. Um, building desks and you see the printer's not in here anymore. It's upstairs and, oh. and, um, <laughs> laminator and all kinds of stuff's upstairs. So it's, uh, <laughs> looking more like an office every day. So, <laughs> well, um, all right. We want to welcome everybody that's in the chat rooms. We yes. got Podbean, we got, uh, Spreaker chats, we got, Paranormal411.org chat room. Yes. Bird Dog's a little listener. Yes. Uh, Shell. Shell. I don't have my glasses on. I didn't put I didn't put my readers on tonight. We got a great show tonight, Mr. Alan Searcy. I hope I'm saying that right. He can he can correct me if I'm wrong. I, th- I think it that's right. At least it looks like Searcy. So. Yeah, he was uh, born and raised in Nashville, Tennessee. Home of the Titans. Mm-hmm. Go Titans. Go Titans. So he is the author of Southern Ghost Stories. Uh, it's a book series uh, with books based on hauntings in the Middle Tennessee area. Uh, Alan ties in ghost stories based on historical events, which is good. Yes. I like that. I, I love history. So. Yeah. Uh, his books have been featured on ABC and CBS, uh, as well as other media outlets in Tennessee. And now on Paranormal 411. Yes, and now he is on Paranormal 411. Uh, we'll go and I'm sure you can find, he, he'll tell all about how to find his books and you can purchase them. Yes. Uh, we're going to bring him on, Mr. Searcy. Is that right? Yes, sir. All right. I did do it right. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> so how you doing? I'm doing great, guys. Thanks for having me on. Hey, it's a pleasure. Uh, thank, thank you for coming on um, in in with such short notice. Yeah, sure, I can do it. That was uh, that was awesome. Um, we really appreciate that. So, um, you know what what got you um, interested in in the uh, paranormal? Oh man, it's, it's a long story. <laughs> we got two hours. Uh, well, well, okay, well, originally. <laughs> Uh, I managed some MMA fighters years ago, back when the UFC and Strike Force Bills were kind of getting going. And um, I guess a few years ago, the guys started getting older and retiring, and I kind of walked away from it because I, I got married and had a family, and it just uh, I enjoyed it so much, and I kind of missed it. And and I had all these crazy stories from my time on the road, and stories I hear, you know, in the locker room, and things that they would tell me, and things that happened backstage. So I just I wrote a book called Legends of Tennessee MMA. Well, after that, um, I have a daughter in college. Uh, she actually went to college in uh, Georgia Southern down there by Savannah. So my wife, she kept nagging me, let's go to Savannah, let's go to Savannah. And I didn't want to go. I want to go to the beach or go to Boston or something. <laughs> so I relented, and I went to Savannah, and I, I loved it. There's just so much history there. You know, when uh, Sherman burned Atlanta and marched to the sea, he got to Savannah, and the mayor's like, hey, we surrender. You know, just don't set us on fire. So you go to you know Savannah, which you know Georgia was an original uh, colony for for England, and there's all this old architecture, and there's just so much history there, and all those big beautiful squares are mass graves from where they had American Revolutionary War battle. So it's just a uh, it's a lot of history, and everything's haunted down there because of all the uh, the war and cholera and yellow fever and all that. And, um, I came back home, and I used to live behind a historic house in Nashville called Traveler's Rest. I'm not sure if you guys have heard of that. Mm. But um, it was owned by John Overton. He was Andrew Jackson's campaign manager, attorney, and really close friend. So 
But before that, in the 1300s, it was a Mississippian Indian village. Well, when Oberton got it in the 1800s, you know, of course, he was a rich, wealthy man. He had slaves. So it was Indian land, and it was a working plantation. And in the 50s, my grandparents bought two acres, and then I moved in in 2005. So when I got there, all these weird things started happening. My first night in the house, there's a trash can in the kitchen that moved eight feet in the middle of the night. Wow. And lights went off and on. Uh, TV turned themselves off and on. These weird things were always happening. So I hopped the fence. I walked over to the historic mansion. I said, hey, you know, there's right over there. This place on it. And they were like, oh, well, I can assure you that nothing goes on here. And when you come to the uh, Traveler's Rest, we teach you about the Ocean family and the Indians and blah, blah, blah. So I was about to leave, and I saw a car pull up. And a lady who was wearing one of the uh, period attire costumes that the staff members wear, she got out of her car. And I walked over and said, ma'am. I live right over there, and you know a lot of weird things are happening. My daughter's scared. Is this place haunted? And they were like, uh, "Sir, this place. We have so many ghosts. I can't talk about it." So okay, I get it. <laughs> so after that, you know, it kind of it, it kind of all made sense. But when we were in Savannah, we went, went on a ghost tour, and when we're down there, I'm sure you guys been on ghost tours before. You go on vacation, yes. you pay twenty or thirty in, bucks. In and you Savannah go to too, we went on one in Savannah. Yeah. Yeah, but when you go on those, I mean, it's fun, but you pay twenty, thirty, and so it's forty dollars, and you go to maybe five, five places. It's kind of a ripoff. So my wife, all the time we're down there, she kept saying, "Someone should make an app for two dollars." Says all the haunted places. So I came home, I bought them back, taught myself some coding, I went back to Savannah, did a whole bunch of research, came back home, did more coding, back to Savannah for more research, uh, came back home, and I launched the Savannah Ghost Map app which is, you know, it's an app of maybe 40, 50 places that are all haunted places you can go. It's like a GPS-based app for $2. So, well, that summer I got bored, and I made one for Nashville. And then Boston, Salem, New Orleans, St. Augustine, I kind of got hooked on it for a while. <laughs> but um, after all the apps, it just it's hard to make an app. Apple is always changing their, their rules, the coding. You know, it's, coding is really difficult. You get one uh, thing wrong in the code, and, you wasted 12 hours and you got to start from scratch. So <laughs> I'm like, you know, I'm just going to write books instead. <laughs> so I just started digging in. And uh, one of the places I discovered working on the Nashville app was Gallatin, Tennessee. And that Gallatin is a small little town just north of Nashville. And it's, there was no battle. Well, there was a sort of skirmish in Gallatin, but there's no major battles like there were in Franklin and Murfreesboro or the outskirts of Nashville. But up here in Gallatin, I learned there was a guy named Leaser Payne. He was a Union general. And he was hanging people up on the square. And they say, he hung, you know, the numbers vary, 70 to 100 to 600, whatever, however many it was. But he was hanging people up on the square. Wow. Well, up here in Gallatin, John Hunt Morgan, the cavalry commander, who is very similar to Nathan Bedford Forrest, he was raiding the Union camps and blowing up trains. I mean, he, he, was, he was trying to interfere with the supply lines because the Union was trying to cut the Army in half, in the Western Asian Theater, and make it out of Georgia and you get to the sea, and you pretty much chop the army in half, and you can divide and conquer. Well, Hunt Morgan was trying to cut the supply lines, and he was up here just making hell for Eliezer Payne. So Eliezer Payne took a heavy-handed approach, and he would go door to door. And, like, if you knew a soldier or you were a prominent citizen, you know, he could arrest you, send you to Nashville, find you. There are instances of him shooting people just because they were related to a soldier or he didn't like the way they looked at him. So, I mean, the Civil War is very complex, and in school you're always taught the Union are the good guys, and they freed the slaves for rape, but it's so much more, so much more to it. Uh, when the, 1862, when the Union rolled into Nashville, after Fort Donaldson, Fort Henry fell, they started occupying Nashville. Well, then with Franklin, Murfreesboro, Springfield, Gallatin, all these major railroad waterway hubs, and they would kick you out of your house, take your cattle, take your crops, I mean, it's just, war was hell. Yeah. And just galloping, all these crazy things happened up there. And a uh, you couple of that with fire and cholera, it just it made for a great place for a whole bunch of hauntings. Mm. Wow. Yeah, that's um, – so uh, what all does kind of like happen in, in Gallatin? I mean, is there is there is it a lot of the stuff that's war-related, or, or is there anything else other than that, or is, is, is that – I mean, pretty- yes, the – there was some major skirmishing in Gallatin up in an area called the Triangle. And supposedly after the skirmishing, they came to the square and some of the buildings became hospitals. But it wasn't the scale of the Battle of Stones River and the Battle of Franklin. Right. Up here, I found a lot of the hauntings in Gallatin were due to poor fire codes. North Water, the main strip, the main street on the square there, 
it burned down three or four times, possibly five. <laughs> wow. And back in the, there were no fire codes in Middle Tennessee until 1935. So typically the buildings are made of wood or brick with wooden floors and wood all in them. You know, you go upstairs, like typically a two-story dwelling, downstairs is a shop upstairs where the owner lived, and you had candles, stoves, oil lamps. Now, one spark, I saw a block on fire, and it happened all the time. Wow. And back then, they're fighting fires with primitive means. You know, they had a wagon that had a pump that you had to hook to a, a cistern, or you had to do a bucket brigade from the closest river or creek. It's just, by the time they got set up, the fires done leveled half the city. <laughs> and they happened, not just in Gallatin, but Murfreesboro, Nashville, New Orleans, Chicago. I mean, you've you, you heard the stories about Chicago. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it's, it happened everywhere. Yeah, I'd say a lot of people passed away in those fires. And what was wild when I, I thought I was done with the book, and I was at this place called Sweeney Swiss, which is a, uh, it's a burger place up on the square. Well, before it was a burger place years ago, it was a pharmacy. And I didn't know this, but I was up there talking to some people. There's an older woman who worked there, and she's like, yeah, well, they say there's a ghost here over her named Sarah. She died in the plague. And I was like, stop the presses. What? what? The plague? <laughs> and she's like, yeah, she died in the plague. So I go home. I'm, I go to the uh, library. I go to the archives. Cholera killed one in 15 people in Gallatin back in 18, I think it was 73, right during Reconstruction. But it got it was some kind of bacteria that got in the water. And it typically affected the poor people. But it, it, it devoured, like, the whole the whole city. The city shut down. The courts stopped. The businesses stopped. People went to Hartsville, Carthage, Hendersonville, just to get away from town because the drinking water was deadly. The people weren't cleaning their privies. Uh, you had trash in the streets, and I've heard stories like in Nashville where pigs and cattle just kind of roamed around, and they're spreading stuff too. So it's wow. the cholera, the silent killer, all over Middle Tennessee in the nineteenth century. Oh, wow, that's crazy. That's what I like about this, because this is history. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. I'm a history buff anyway, so I, I love history. <clears throat> but when you could uh, tie in some ghost stories to it, that's even better. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, that's what y'all's been history. I mean, the, the hauntings and ghost stuff is cool, but the history is the stuff I really, really enjoy. Yes. Last night I was reading this big article about dueling in the 18, 19, in the 1800s, and I was telling my wife about it, and she's just rolling her eyes like, just shut up and go to bed. I'm ready to go to sleep. Come on now. <laughs> oh. yeah. I've got everybody in my household just interested in ghosts. Yeah. <laughs> we watch we watch it every night from daylight till dark. That's funny. Uh, I love it. Yeah. Well, you know, your introduction to ghosts was pretty good. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was at my house my old house not this house but my old house was pretty haunted so yeah tell him about the uh event that we had up there at your house oh <laughs> when we um when we when i had you come over oh yeah <laughs> so now this has been quite a few years back what do you say about 10 years ago it was 2011 it was just before we started Project Dark Corona. It's actually what motivated us. Yeah. Sort of. Uh, well, it first started out as being a website. My, uh, myhouseishaunted.com is what it started out being. And uh, just going through, you know, putting up as far as like, uh, you know, what happened that day or something like that. Um, but we had a little girl that, that was there that I knew was there. She would she would um, mess around and, and uh, in the morning times I could turn on the surround sound and the TV and stuff and sit there and watch TV. And she would turn up the surround sound system to max. And, uh, and it would just go to max every time. And, uh, so I'd sit there and start turning down the remote and it would go back to max every time it would just, it just kept happening. And, uh, I, I just found it as a fun game. And then, you know, when I told her, I said, Hey, you know, we got to stop because we're going to wake everybody up. It it stopped. It, it, It didn't happen anymore. So I told Jason, I was like, "Hey, um, you need to come over. We need to we need to actually investigate the house and 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 just see what's going on." <laughs> and um, so we got our EVPs out, or our our uh, electronic voice recorders out, and was recording and and uh, and and walking around the house. And so we started asking some questions, and it was really nothing was going on that much at that time. No. So Jason sits down in my chair 
and um, his EMF starts going crazy when he puts it over his knee. He moves it away, and it, it goes away, and then it goes over his knee, and it, it starts going crazy again. And so we start doing another EVP session, and uh, and he asks, are you sitting on my lap? And we get a little girl's voice that goes, yes. <laughs> and, of course, we don't hear it at that time, you know. And uh, later on, we we replay it back, and and uh, when Jason hears yes, Jason's like, uh, I've got to go home now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he didn't come back for two weeks. It was two weeks before I came back. It was pretty shocking. <laughs> so what I found over the years is just whatever is doing this and acting up, it's just mischievous. I mean, I've yeah. been to. God, over a thousand places or supposed paranormal activities have taken place, and I can count on three fingers. And the number of places I've been where something mean is actually there. The people yeah. have had things done to them. It's just mischievous stuff. They want to let you know from time to time they're there, and they leave you alone for the most part. Yeah. Have Have you done the investigations before? Do you, Have you done any of them? Oh yeah. When I do the books, I've, I've I've done, I've done a handful of investigations, probably every book I've done. And one of the coolest ones, it, I mean, it really blew me away. Uh, up there in, 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 well, I guess it's down there in Franklin, Tennessee. Um, it's it's a town maybe 20 minutes north, uh, south of Nashville. Uh, that's where the Battle of Franklin took place in the Civil War. And you had uh, 20,000 Confederates going head-to-head with 20,000 Federal soldiers. Oh. Well, the night before, the Federal soldiers walked past the, the Confederates in the middle of the night. Uh, General John Bell Hood didn't leave clear directions for what to do in case they encountered the enemy. And the Union just kind of walked past them, like, like walk, literally walked down the street while they were camping out and sleeping. So uh, John Bell Hood woke up the next morning. He's pretty ticked off. So he orders a full frontal assault to the Union who got ahead of him, and they're already dug in. They got battle lines and everything. Well, it was pretty much a suicide mission because, I mean, the, the, it was a slaughter. The Confederates, you know, ran in on them, and it was a, it was a bloodbath. Uh, technically, the Confederates won because they took the battlefield because the Union retreated and went back to Nashville. But after the battle, the Franklin Square turned into a hospital. Literally, every building became a hospital. So we were in this one place that it's a hair salon. It's really an old house. But um, they kept saying that, uh, yeah, we see this, we hear that, things are always happening. Um Hang on, I got my story straight. It's a different place into the story. I'm thinking of. Sorry, I've written some books. Y'all run together. But there's a place on the square. It's called the White Building. I'll tell you the other story next in a minute. But um, it's called the White Building. It's right there on the end of the square. But years before, it was the Bradley home. Um, Robert Bradley was a businessman, and the night of the Battle of Franklin, his home was overtaken and became a hospital. So. In 1910, they tore it down and built a doctor's office there. Well, as soon as the doctor's office was built, the doctor contracted something from one of his patients and died, like, within a few months. So, gradually, over time, it became an office building, and then now it's a star- there's a Starbucks on the end. In the middle, there's a eye doctor, and on the end, there's a mattress store. So, when I was researching the book, the uh, Starbucks on the end was telling me, yeah, we've well, seen a uh, tremor boy in our basement. So, over the eye doctor, they said, yeah, we saw a bugler in our basement. So the guy at the mattress store is like, yeah, there's something in the basement. I don't know what it is. So I got a friend of mine named Mark Walsh. He's been a investigator since like the 80s or 90s. He's, he's done this for a long time. And uh, he brought an echo. It a, no, it's a geoport he brought and a whole bunch of equipment. We set, we set up in the basement, and we didn't get anything for the first 30, 45 minutes. So finally, I get on my phone, and I'll play the Battle Hammer, Battle Hammer of the Republic, which would have been what they would have marched to. You know, it's a fight song of the, of the Union. And when I did that, everything lit up. It just went nuts, like the 4th of July. Wow. So after a few minutes, we went upstairs to the exam room where supposedly people have heard things and been touched. And the same thing, we got nothing. So finally, I played the Battle Hammer of the Republic, and it goes nuts again. So after a while, the owner of the building, Wendy, she's getting bored. She said, hey, what's your name? Now at the geoport, we heard this voice go, Drake. And uh, she goes, did you say Blake or Drake? And it went Drake a second time. And so she goes, did you say Drake? And it said, yes. So not one, not two, but three confirmations of the name Drake. Wow. And that was just fascinating. So I go home, I'm Googling, I go to the archives. Turns out Thomas Jefferson Drake was in the 10th Ohio and he died in the Battle of Franklin. But the kicker is he was a drummer. So he would have played the Battle of the Republic. So I can't say for sure he died in the building that was there before them, 
But it's a really, really odd coincidence that Thomas Jefferson Drake died in the Battle of Franklin, and he was a drummer. Wow. That is that is amazing. The other, the other story I started in, sorry, I got confused. I kind of run again after a while. But there's another old uh, house there in Franklin. It's on the... Uh, Third Avenue, which there's a whole lot of houses there haunted on Third Avenue. But the one we went to is a hairdresser, or it's a salon. And uh, they seen a lady in there, and um, the story goes there's a lady came in early one morning, and she opened the door. She got everything ready for business that day. And then, like on the security camera, she see her just stop and just stare into her room for like two or three minutes. And then she takes off running out the back door. Well, she called the owner and said, Hey, there's a lady in here, and, and she's, I saw her and I, I ran out. But the kicker was, after she ran outside, she looked in the window, and the lady's watching her from the inside of the window. Oh. So that was kind of creepy. But we go in there with Mark Washington from Rutherford County Paranormal, and we set up, and we kind of we're kind of picking up through a geoport. It's a Confederate soldier, but it's, we're getting kind of mixed signals. A geoport. I never really thought much of it, but I've had some weird things happen that I, I, I'm kind of leaning towards where I believe it. And um, so we're in there. And all of a sudden, I said, soldier, what's your name? And from the corner of the room, we hear an audible whisper, Sarah. And so, I mean, I've got it. I, I have it on tape. I've, I've, it's, it's amazing. We thought we had a soldier that was talking to the geoport, but there's a lady whispering to us from the corner of the room. And that was just really, really cool and really, really creepy. That's that's crazy right there. That's the kind of stuff sort of I like. <laughs> Supposedly her husband, they got into an argument and she pushed, she was pushing on the stairs and she broke her neck and she died. But that's just really odd that they've seen the woman inside the house and then we got her name, Sarah. Mm. Wow. Yeah. That's that right. That right there is, is cool. I, I like when, you know, you could get those confirmations <clears throat> as far as that. Um, I have a, a question and I know Jason, Jason has some as far as like, um, uh, what we was talking about, you know, before, as far as um, the, um, what was it? The uh, uh, Grand Ole Opry and stuff. But yeah. <clears throat> did you do any um, investigations and uh, as far as, or anything as far as, because I mean, you're right there <clears throat> at the uh, area, of probably one of the greatest talked about hauntings uh, in the U S I, I would think of, um, and you know, that's, uh, the, the bell, you know, uh, bell witch and everything. Um, did you ever look you know, into any of that? Well, you know, it's funny you bring it up. It's, I've heard those stories all my life, you know, Grumville, mm-hmm. Tennessee, it's like, you know, you do this, the bell witch will get you, or you don't go here, the bell witch is there, you know, it's, just, it's kind of like a, a myth and a legend I've heard all my life. And as I've done all this stuff with the books and investigating and research, I've left it alone because it seems like it's it's kind of grown out of this, this little a couple of things that were happening in this haunted cave and and now like everybody who lives in Adams Tennessee or Springfield knows somebody who took a rock out of the cave had a wreck on the way home it's just it's kind of overdone I've left it alone because it just I feel like no matter what I do because I try to find out what really happened mm-hmm. no matter what I say or do people are going to believe they want to believe and mm-hmm. I've just kind of left it alone there, there's a really old story. Um, I run a Facebook page called Tennessee Hauntings. I try to post stuff occasionally, like old stories. And there's a legend where Andrew Jackson, he yes. went to go visit John Bell. Because John Bell, the man who owned you know, the Bell Witch or the Bell Cave and where all the stuff happened, he was a he was a prominent politician. He ran for president against Abraham Lincoln. I mean, if he, if he wouldn't have been on the ticket, the uh, Democrats would have won, and there wouldn't have been a civil war. There would have been eventually, but you know, the Democrats split the ticket three ways, and it was John Bell and then um, – he was the guy of Breckenridge and somebody else. But anyway, he was a candidate for president. He's a very prominent guy. But um, they say that Jackson went to see him because he'd heard about the witch, the ghost, or whatever it was in the cave. So supposedly, as the story goes, Jackson rode from the Hermitage, which is his home, I guess a little bit to the east of Nashville, all the way to Adams, Tennessee, him and a group of his men. And they get close to the cave, and his, his wagon just stops. And the horses won't move, and it's just stuck. So finally, something happens. They try to summon her, and then I forget how it goes exactly, but it ends with her saying, General, you may proceed. Then the wagon rolls, and he goes back to see John Bell, and he leaves that night. So there's all kinds of stories with it. You don't know what's true and what's not, but it's just something that everybody out in this part of the country talks about. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I I find it really fascinating. We was wanting to go there this year, but they had it closed, I guess, for the 
for the COVID or whatever. And, and so we wasn't able to go this year. Um, we did, we did go to, um, what was the hospital there? Um, Jason. South Pittsburgh. Yep. Old South Pittsburgh. That's it. We went to old South Pittsburgh. Me and the wife did this year and, uh, it was actually really good. Um, and, uh, we, next, next thing we're, I don't know, we're, we're planning on doing something maybe pretty big as far as either, um, going over here to the, um, what is that, Jason? The, I'm, I'm, Jason's half my brain over here. Um, you know what I'm talking about? The, the, uh, the prison. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> now your brain's not working. Wait a minute. You, you've, cl- you've brain clouded me. <laughs> um anyway <laughs> yeah the the prison the old prison over here in um brushy mountain, brushy mountain that's it brushy mountain. brushy mountain we're we're planning on going there sometime um and uh taking quite a few people with us and stuff and and i've done a lot of research on on it as far as uh some of the best places to go in in the prison as far as you know the most haunted spots and, um, and then, you know, so we're, we're, we're trying to plan, plan that out pretty good. Um, yeah, but, but we really wanted to go up there and, uh, and see the, you know, do the bell witch thing, but they've had it closed. They did, they didn't open up at all this year, really. I think with the movie and stuff with that, they've kind of got it out of control. Too. Well, the movie sucked cause it didn't yeah. even follow the story <laughs> at all. So. <laughs> I, I can see why you you, you didn't yeah. do anything with it because the media and all this have just got it all out of whack. The history's probably off in the movie. It is and everything. You know, I watched a a show with uh, Josh Gates and them, and they um, where he has two two people that go out and do the investigations for him and stuff, and they went there, <clears throat> and everybody was saying, "Oh, it's just wise tales. It's really nothing. It's really nothing." But Towards the end of the show, there was a guy that was, um, I don't know if he was a, a historian there, but I think so. He he worked uh, with the historians or something anyway, but he had an actual letter that was written that actually mentioned what was happening to John Bell and his family and stuff like that. And so, it, you know, if nothing else, it is based on truth somewhere. Yeah. Yeah, but as far as like writing a book about it, it'd be like me asking you, say, hey, why don't you write a book about Bigfoot? Right. You know, because there's so much stuff published and so much hearsay and legends. Yes. I just I just have to leave it alone. Yeah, yeah, I, I understand why. I do. Yeah. Um, now, the uh, Jason, I know you had some something that you was Oh, I know about. you did the uh, the your newest series, book series, or the latest book in your series was Opryland. Yeah, and that was a little fun project. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, yeah, I started with Gallatin and then Frank, you no, know, Gallatin and Murfreesboro and then Franklin. And, you know, when you start writing books about haunted places, you know, I've done meet and greets and autogra- or, uh, book signings and speaking engagements. When you write books, people kind of tell you things. You know, like, hey, you're never going to believe this, but, and they tell you the story. And, yeah. and back in the 90s, I worked at the Opryland Hotel which is a hotel right there by where the theme park used to be and where the mall is now. Mm-hmm. And I remember being on break one day and I heard somebody talking about the old lady. And I didn't think much about it, but I heard somebody mention something a few months later. And and the kind of what I got was they had a, a ghost of an old lady in, in the hotel. So, you know, I just kind of say that back in my mind. I didn't think much about it. I was a kid, 18, 19 years old when I worked there. So I started writing these books and I started hearing things about the theme park being haunted. It was like, you know, growing up in Nashville, Opryland was huge. That was, it was like Walt Disney World for me back when I was a kid. You know, all these roller coasters, and uh, it's just, it was the place to be. Well, it opened in 1972, and in 1997, it closed. They chose to shut it down and build a mall. Well, I kept hearing about this. Well, they, I got to back up to really tell the story. Back, I guess, in the 1800s, it belonged to the McGavick family. That was part of their their plantation and their farm and their family's land. The Gavics were a very prominent family. Uh, you might've heard of Carton, the uh, place in Franklin. That's the, uh, the largest field hospital mm-hmm. in the Battle of Franklin. And it's really haunted too. But um, 
the McGavicks were all intertwined, and one of their cousins was the mayor of Nashville for a time. They were a very proud of their family. Well, I guess in 1962, uh, Miss Mary Louise Bransford McGavick, she was the last heiress. She had no children, so when she passed away, she left instructions for the land to go to her church. And she wanted the church to use it to build an orphanage or a hospital. So her body's not even cold, and they, they sell it to WSM, who, which, of course, owned the Grand Ole Opry and WSM AM, the radio station in Nashville, and they built our land theme park to go along with the Grand Ole Opry. Mm-hmm. And they said once it got open and it started, it was operational, at night they would see an old lady standing in the gazebos or by the front entrance or on one of the stages. They said, uh, one of the stories in the book, someone told me that they had worked there and they were, you no, know, it was like he worked there, her friend, this happened to him. He was picking up trash or getting ready to close down, doing something at night. And this really old lady in like a really old looking dress walked up and was like, son, can you please tell me what year it is? And he's saying it's a joke. So he's saying something smart to say. And before he can even form the words, turns around and she's gone. Hmm. Uh, I heard the stories where she chased people out of the theme park. Um, it's just, it just it was really fascinating, and just the more you dig in and the more history, and uh, I think you alluded to earlier off air, but there was people who died in the theme park. Um, I think it was the 80s, there was a, a janitor, and the, the story is he was hard of hearing, and as, before they, the park had opened for the day, he was picking up trash by the rock and roller coaster, and they sounded an alarm, everybody kind of cleared the track, well, I don't guess he heard it, and he's ever picking up trash, and it hit him, knocked him 15, 20 feet up in the air, and killed him. So... But he wasn't the only person that died in the park. There was a boy from Knoxville. I think he was 10 or 12 years old. He had a heart condition. And he died on one of the roller coasters. It was really, I mean, it's really a sad situation altogether. But the really weird thing about it was his family opted not to sue. You know, nowadays, something like that happens. You know, that family's going to own the damn theme park. Right. Well, well, he, his family, their stance was like, well, you know, he knew he was not in, in good health. And he really wanted to ride the roller coaster. So... We knew the risk, and that's it, that's the end of it. So, I guess the theme park got kind of lucky right there. Wow. Do, you, do you remember what year the janitor got killed? Oh man, it's in the book. Um, it was in the eighties. Because that's about the time that my grandfather took me, and that day somebody got killed because they shut they shut the the roller coaster down. I don't remember if it was the cannonball. Or if they called the cannonball the rock and roller coaster or not, but somebody got killed that day when I was there. Yeah, back in the early '80s, it was uh, there were two big roller coasters: the Wabash Cannonball and yeah. the Rock and Roller Coaster. So yeah, the accident happened with on the Rock and Roller Coaster. Yeah, I was there one of those when somebody got killed or died on the roller coaster. Yeah, that's really that's really weird. That's, that's bad timing. Yeah, <laughs> that's Jason. Bad timing. <laughs> <laughs> so, why did Opry the the theme park close? Do you know? Well, there was a change in leadership at WSM, and they wanted to go in different directions. Um, after the gentleman retired, there was a, a younger guy who came in, and he wanted to incorporate. He, what he wanted to do was turn Opryland into like downtown Disney or the Strip in Las Vegas. And he wanted to bring in shopping and, and stores and movie theaters and make it like a whole big experience. Mm-hmm. And the thing is, as Opryland declined, Dollywood and the casinos in Tunica, Mississippi, right there outside Memphis, were on the rise. So their numbers were down, but they weren't down as bad as what they probably should have been. Uh, but you can see the graphs in the book. I have the attendance chart. Like You can kind of see what happened, but... Yeah, like I mentioned, Tunica, Mississippi, all those casinos open, and then Dollywood really starting to come into to their own over there in East Tennessee, your neck of the woods. It really hurt the attendance here at Opryland, and I guess the new leadership panicked and decided to pull the plug, and they partnered with uh, who, who's the corporation, the Mills Corporation, to build the new mall there and have year-round, uh, instead of you know having a theme park only ran from like April to – well, they originally, when they first opened, it was from like May to, I guess, August. And they expanded hours from April to October, then April to December. You know, you got three or four months where there's no money coming in at all. And even in the winter months, it's, it's limited hours and you're not drawing many people. But from a business standpoint, the mall is, is open every day. So you're always going to have income coming in. And, you know, the corporation saw that bottom line. And that's why they decided to just pull the plug, close the park. Hmm. 
Yeah, sometimes I miss that park. That was uh, that was about the closest one besides Lake Winnipesoka. Oh man, you don't even know. I mean, I grew up in that that far at park. But that broke my heart. And I mean, people here still still talk about it. I know people that won't even go to the mall. They're still angry about it. Mm. Wow. I know the new that new Opryland Hotel is supposed to be beautiful. I mean, it's, it's the same hotel uh, that it was built, I guess, in the uh, late seventies. But they, they added on to it so many yeah. times. And the ghost story there is uh, the same lady. They see the lady in black or lady in white, whatever they see her wearing. Or they see her in the ballrooms. She mostly gravitates towards the original part of the hotel, the Magnolia Wing. Mm-hmm. That's where they have electronics and lights, and people find things missing, or they'll go to the bathroom and they'll leave, walk out the door, and they, they hear the water turn itself back on. Weird things like that always happen there. And like I, I told you, the old lady, that's the story I heard, and that's what she's still there today. Wow. But see, it's not just the, the whole Opry Land complex is huge because it's you had, you had the theme park, you had the Grand Ole Opry House. You had um, the hotel. You have all these shops, touristy shops across the street. And the thing is that that, that old lady I was talking about, Miss Mary Louise Grants from McGavick, You know that they say it's her too. But being right there by the river, the Cumberland River, you know that's that was old Indian land. That's where Native Americans would have camped and hunted and lived. Yeah. And I've heard, I talked to Empath. He went to the hotel, and she's like, I picked up on some deaths here because there wasn't murder suicide in the hotel back in the nineties, mm-hmm. but. All that was Indian land. She's like, I picked up on Native American spirits there. So maybe that has something to do with it, too. Yeah. So uh, I don't want to give away your book too much because I want people to, to, you know, purchase it and, and read it. But, well, I guess we need to take a quick break so everybody can get their their, their whistle wet and use the bathroom and stuff. But, uh when we come back, I'd like to talk about uh, more about the the Opry, the Grand Ole Opry, all right, and some of the the spirits or whatever that's that haunts it. And I was going to ask you another question: Do you have anything about the Ryman in there? Yeah, we can go to after the break. It's okay. all kind of intertwined. Okay, well, awesome. Okay, well, we'll go to break. Real but quick don't and... give away your book because we want to <laughs> keep them in suspense. You yes, know? yes. Just no, enough, <laughs> just enough. <laughs> okay, all right, we'll be right back. Um, we're talking with Alan Searcy and his uh, Southern Ghost Stories collection of books that he has out. And um, remember, we are live on Spreaker and on Podbean, but you could also come to Project, or Project, oh my Lord, Paranormal411.org. It's been a month, David. It has, I know. And you could come into our uh, live chat room and uh and chat with us there also and uh, we want to thank all of our premium members we haven't done that in a little while thank the premium members oh yeah yes the premium members thank you uh steve over in the uk uh what's up in contact buddy yeah yeah we haven't heard from you in a while you haven't sent us an email and uh and we want to thanks for the new logo for for the new everything that's that was good that's that's all came from Steve Manser over in the UK. Our new logo, yep, done and, a good job. And um, so uh, you're listening to uh, Paranormal Four One One. The hosts are Jason Scott and David Reagan. And uh, we'll be back right after these messages. In a world on the edge of oblivion, go to paranormal four one one dot org. For all of your paranormal, extraterrestrial, and cryptid needs. Thanks for listening to the show. You can find us on Facebook and Twitter at Paranormal411. Join us on the website at Paranormal411.org. It's free to sign up and become a member. All of our upcoming shows are on the guest and events page. You can also listen to past shows on the website as well. And if you like the show and want to support us, you can do that by becoming a premium member for only $2 a month. Thanks for listening to Paranormal 411. Join us. This is Jeff Reagan of the Band Catalyst. Visit Paranormal 411 
Click on our link on the right-hand side to listen to or purchase any of our albums on BandLab. All right, we're back from that short break. And um, again, we want to thank uh, Catalyst for um, oh, yeah. for that awesome music that they allow us to use. And, um, you know, like I said before, just go to our website, paranormal411.org, on the front page. You could click on their link. It goes to Band Labs, and you can sit there and listen to the show or listen to uh, all their music and purchase it there, too. And... Um, I would suggest listen to all their music. They've got tons of songs, and, and, and there ain't none of them that are bad. Oh, He's yeah. actually working on something right now that I that I can't wait till he releases so we could play it on the show, because uh, it's 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 going to be a fantastic song. Um, we're talking with Alan Searcy, and he, uh, talking about his Southern Ghost Stories books um, about Middle Tennessee. And uh, remember, we are live on Spreaker and on Podbean. You could also come to the website and listen to the show and chat with us live there also. So um, we also want to thank all of our premium members. <clears throat> and um, remember, on the website, you could also go to ParanormalityRadio.com. We've got a light link to it. And you could vote for us. And um, we um, usually do pretty good uh good there as far as staying in the top 25 and um we actually since we've changed our name have not uh 
put our new stuff up there, have we, Jason? <laughs> no. So I, I don't even need to say that right now, do I? Yeah, we need to uh, change it. We got to change our information. But um, but yeah, um, go check Paranormality Radio out there, radio dot com. They're actually really uh, really cool guys and stuff. They got a they got a magazine and all kinds of stuff that you can check out. So, um, are you ready? We ready. Bring Alan back on. How you doing, Alan? I'm doing great. So, um, so did you get your whistle, your whistle wet? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we like to take these little breaks. So yeah, when you're mm-hmm. live, you got to take a break. I mean, you, you, you just can't <laughs> two, two when hours you're recording ahead. it, it's different, but when you're live, you got to get up and take a break. Yeah. So I know you had some questions, Jason. Oh, I was just wanting him to, uh, talk about the, uh, the actual Opry House. Well, there's several different Opry, Opry Houses, actually. Uh, it started as a radio show in a uh, studio. Well, actually, it started in a, like an office building. But people in the 30s just started jamming to the office. They built another studio on, t- in, on top of the office building, on another floor. And uh, eventually got too big, and it bounced around to several different venues in Nashville. But eventually went to the Raman Auditorium, which is downtown Nashville. And it was actually built for, it's called the, uh, it's, it's the Gospel Tabernacle is what it's called. It was built for uh, revivals and, and church uh, functions. Hmm. A guy named Thomas Ryman, he was a steamboat captain. He made a fortune on the Cumberland River just uh, bringing stuff, you know, from Little or Cincinnati, New Orleans, up to Nashville. Um, and he made a killing and he made so much money and he was like a big gambler and just a hell raiser. Well, he went to a revival meeting from a, there's a, uh, preacher in town he went to hear him just for just for fun he i think he was drunk actually when he went there but like the message he heard it stuck with him and from then he got saved and he he decided you want to use his money and power to do something good he built the, the gospel tabernacle there on fourth avenue well after he died it kind of went downhill i think they used it for like politicians used it for stump speeches and think it hosts some boxing matches and uh, eventually when the Grand Opry needed a bigger venue, they bounced around finally with the Ryman. Um, I guess it was the 50s or 60s, I can't remember the exact date. But they went there and uh, they got established. And But the thing was, it's an older building. There's no air conditioning. Uh, they got really hot. There's no dressing rooms really for the performers. So I guess it was the 80s when they built the Grand Ole Opry House over by the Opryland Complex. And that was WSM's plan. They wanted the theme park. They wanted a hotel. And they wanted the Opry House right there. It's like, you know, you come and you spend all your money right there on the premises. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's also haunted by Miss McGavick, they say. But I also talked to a security guard. He told me that they had a really weird thing happen next door at the Roy Acuff House. I'm not sure if you guys know who Roy Acuff is, but he was uh, like the king of country music. Well, as he got older, his wife passed away. They built a house for him next to the Opry House. And he lived there for several years until he passed away. Well, that's also it's said to be pretty haunted. Well, the security guard was saying they had an issue there at the Acuff house that night where one of the security guards got really scared. So he dealt with that. They went back to the opera house. And he was sitting on one of the pews there. And all of a sudden, he heard these loud sounds like clanking cowboy boots just walking across the opera stage. And he's looking around. It's like 3 in the morning. And he couldn't figure out what it was. But that those boots just walked across the stage right there in front of him. Hmm. But, you know, they, 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 they seen the lady... In the Opry House, uh, weird things happen with electronics, and it's just, you know, the same kind of things you hear at the theme park. Yeah. So uh, I've heard of a story about Hank Williams in, in one of those, maybe the Ryman or the or the Grand Ole Opry House. Yeah, they say it was the Ryman. I've heard that, too. They said they've seen him there at Ryman as well as Tootsie's, the uh, – the bar there right behind the ramen. It's the world famous honky tonk. It's painted purple. Mm-hmm. Uh, so possibly he's the only person or one of the only people who's been kicked out of the Opry because uh, mm-hmm. he was a hellraiser and a drinker and yeah. he clashed the ownership of the Opry and they kicked him out. Mm-hmm. And they say his spirit's the haunts of the ramen, supposedly. Uh, I've heard stories about people who have claimed they've, seen, they've heard him and they've, I don't know, it's just a whole lot of stories and hearsay. But also the bar next door, they have the same thing. They swear they see him in the alleyway there. Hmm. Wow. Now, didn't Porter Wagner host the Opry? And he was a major star there. I mean, yeah. they're, they're, the host is really like a radio announcer. Oh. And they have, 
I don't know if you, I'm not sure if you've ever been there, but they have like a lot of the same performers. Like as they get older, Porter Wagner, it's kind of like a residency. You know, he'd be there every Friday night, every Saturday night. And little Jimmy Dickens or just the older performers usually stick around. I think in Nashville, there's always guest appearances. Mm-hmm. My wife and I went a couple years ago and VR 549, they were playing pretty much every Saturday. But Howdy Loveless showed up and Randy Travis made a special appearance. It's just kind of, it's kind of a fun thing to do, especially if you enjoy country music. Yeah. Uh, uh, your question, Porter Wagner. Yeah, he, he was always there, but he, uh, I think he died a couple of years ago, but I haven't heard any ghost stories about Porter Wagner. Okay. I have heard a saying because you know he wore those real gaudy outfits. Someone said, yeah. all, the, all, the glitter, "All the glitters isn't gold. Sometimes it's Porter Wagner." I, I have a I have a cousin that looks exactly like Porter Wagner. It's crazy. Hmm. I always thought he, you know, he was real blingy, <laughs> but it, you know, he was a good, good, good artist. Hmm. <clears throat> So he was like the uh, Elvis of the country music industry, I guess. Dressed like Elvis. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure he was as big, but yeah, he was, he was a pretty popular draw. Him and Dolly Parton, they were a touring act for many years. There's rumors yeah. that Dolly and Porter had a relationship up, and hmm. she wrote I Will Love You for him when they kind of stopped touring together and went their own different ways. Wow. I wouldn't doubt it. So, um... <laughs> What else has happened over there in Nashville? What what else is in your oh, book? Lord. <laughs> I mean, where I, do I start, man? I know well, I've been well, to the Hermitage. The Hermitage, yeah. The, and the weird thing about the Hermitage is, for years, there's I've heard whispers and rumors, and I've talked to people who used to work there. They tell me stories, but you go to the Hermitage, and they won't tell you anything. Right. But over the past couple of years with the pandemic, all these, all these historic sites – they're hurting so bad. They've had to do ghost tours and uh, embrace the paranormal to get people in. I know Rosemont, this historic house in Galveston up here in, in uh, my neck of the woods, they never really talked about the paranormal. But mm-hmm. 2020 was just so terrible. They had to do something. Now they rent the building out for ghost investigations and uh, they do ghost tours. And it's like they've done really well, made a bunch of money with it. Now they're embracing it. Same thing with the Lotes House in Franklin. The director, and he, he and I talked, and he told me that you know, they were having a very hard time compared to 2019 in 2020 because there's anything going on, and they had to do something. So they opened up for go, for investigations and ghost tours, and they really embraced it, and it's really helped their business. But you have other places like uh, like Carton, the place I mentioned earlier, the Field Hospital, and the Carter House where Battle Franklin was like ground zero. Mm-hmm. Those guys will talk. Like I've been told you can get fired if you can bring it up or tell a guest that, wow. you know, yeah, there were ghosts. Mentioned. Yeah, some people are very particular, and you know, I, I get it. If you run a business, you might turn people away, but I think it'll turn more people on to your business if you just embrace it. And Absolutely. Tell them to go. Yeah, we we have some places here in Loudon where we live that are pretty pretty haunted, and um, one place is actually kind of abandoned. And and me, the wife and I, want to buy the place and try to bring it back and actually see if we could do a, uh, a you know a a haunted bed and breakfast out of the place. Um, hmm. Because I mean, this area right here has a lot of history here in Loudon itself. And, um, and so, I mean, matter of fact, we was um, part of a uh, investing, well, a, a little ghost tour, I guess on Halloween. Yeah. It was actually history slash ghost tour. Yeah. Um, and, um, and it was really, really fun and fa- and fantastic and, and stuff. And there was actually a Cherokee village right here, yeah. uh, in Loudon that, that worked the ferry. Yeah. You mentioned bed and breakfast. There's a bed and breakfast, uh, in, it's in Bellbuckle, Tennessee, which is a little bit South of, uh, Murfreesboro. Well, you know, there was so much skirmishing and, and fighting here during the war, you know, a lot of, you know, if he had like 10, 15 guys who saw a handful of Confederate soldiers, it wouldn't go in the newspaper. It just it would just happen and kind mm-hmm. of slip through the cracks. Well, this little bed and breakfast in Bell Buckle, you go upstairs and you can see like a little a red ring in the floor and like little droplets for, you know, I guess they were operating up there by the window. Mm. And uh, it, no one knows what happened. You know, you read about the battles in Murfreesboro and some Tullahoma stuff, but there's really nothing to go on for Bell Buckle. 
But I can tell you from being at been breakfast and something bad happened close by because there's blood stains all over that house. Wow. But the, the thing is, the owner, he doesn't want anything to do with it. You know, the girl who managed it for years, she'd tell me all these crazy things, but she's like, just don't put it in your books. I, I can't, he will not have this publicized. Hmm. So I, I talked to her occasionally and I'd really love to tell a story that she says he's just dead set against it. So it's, you know, that's her wishes. I won't go against it. Wow. That's, <clears throat> I don't know, you know, with this, with the way things are today, you know, um, I guess we could all thank things like Coast to Coast AM radio um, for the many, many, many years that I've been listening to them. Um, <clears throat> and, um, and also, you know, when the original Ghost Hunters came on and uh, on Sci-Fi so many years ago, um, it started, people started um, being okay with talking about stuff like that. And you would think that, you know, even even where we live, you know, in the Bible Belt, that um, that it would be, you know, eh, to talk about that kind of stuff. But but it isn't. And, and it's, that's, it's really weird, you know, in today's time. Yeah, it's funny. When I did the Gallatin book, um, there's three churches on Main Street, and all three were used during the Civil War as hospitals. And they would kind of hem and haul around it, and, you know, I would get stories out of them. I went to Murfreesboro, and I went to Franklin, and zip zero zilch. They wouldn't discuss it. There's one place in Franklin where the guy told me, he said, he said yeah, it's haunted, but I'm not going to tell you what happens. So it's like, okay, <laughs> what do you say? <laughs> that, that, that Bible Belt thing, it's real. People, you know, they, you know that's, that's how they're raised, and, and I, I get it. Uh, uh, you know, I'm not going to push back on it. It's what you believe. That's, right. that's what it is. Right. Yeah. It's, it's, it's funny how, how people roll back on that, but you know, um, you would think with as mainstream, as mainstream as, as these kind of things are nowadays, um, you know, the church's point of view, how do you define that? You know, cause it may conflict with what you're teaching. And when I, when I, met, I did the Gallatin book, I met a lady, she's an empath and it's really, really weird how I met her. I guess I'll go ahead and tell you the story since we got a few minutes. Yeah. Um, so I kept hearing the library's haunted in Gallatin. So I went to the library a bunch of times and talked to seven or eight ladies. And each time it's like, no, no, no ghost stories here. So finally I go and there's a lady and they told me that she'd been there the longest and just talked to her. So I went to her and I was talking to her. She's like, oh, honey, we're not haunted. It's the old library that's haunted. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. So I went to the old library, which is now used as an office building. And I walk in, I look over and to my left and I saw a lady and she looks me dead in the eye and puts her head down kind of like it's just really really weird like awkward so i kept walking and um i was talking to a lady who also worked there i said ma'am i'm gonna work on this book i've been hearing things about this building being haunted is it true and she starts laughing and she points to the lady who had her head down she said go talk to her so i walk over there and she lifts her head up and like matter of fact she's like yeah there's a lady here you know she's in the back uh she's not haunting here she enjoys it here this is where she wants to be and uh she told me she had like a really older beehive style haircut and and we had a long conversation, but like she just, she's an empath. She picks up on things. And I guess that she picked up on me coming and talking to her about it. And she was kind of uncomfortable, yeah. but uh, we got to be really good friends. And uh, a few nights later, I found a picture of the old library. And when it was the old library, I sent it to her and she's like, yeah, that's her. That's the lady I see in the back. So, but uh, we got to be good friends and she would, she would tell me things that only I knew were in the book. It's just, she was like spot on with so many things. It's really, really wild. But she and I got to talking one day, and I was like, well, who are these people? Why are they there? And according to her, this is her theory, and there's no way to back this up or even find out if it's true. She said that the spirits that we encounter are the so-called ghosts. They're, early in life, they're raised in the church, and they're very, very religious, very spiritual. And when they die, when they die suddenly, they feel they can't go to the light. So they stay here because they're scared. Mm-hmm. So... I don't know if that's true or not, but it kind of makes sense. You know, if you were raised a certain yes. way or you had to live a certain life and you do die and you feel like you've messed up and you're not worthy, maybe you would stay behind. And no one knows, but it's only theory I've heard that really makes the most sense to me. Yeah, no, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I, I can kind of understand that, you know. Um, you die, then all of a sudden you're like, oh, well, I, I don't think I don't think so. <laughs> not yet. Funny, Shannon, but when I did the Murfreesboro book, uh, Southern Ghost Stories, Murfreesboro, Spirit of Stones River, the shameless plug there. But um, <laughs> I took her to several places, 
And one of the buildings we went to, it's a bakery now, but back in the 1800s, it was across the street from where the slave auctions used to be. And they say that in the basement is where they would hold the slaves. So I took her downstairs in this real creepy, dingy basement, and my EMF meter is just off the charts. Um, and all of a sudden, she starts shouting, you can go if you want to go. Go if you want to go. And she's yelling at the top of her lungs. And my EMF meter is just going nuts. <laughs> so finally, she kind of sits down. She has a headache, and my EMF just dies. I said, what, what just happened? What's going on? She's like, she doesn't want to go. She's not going to cross over. So it's just really, I felt uncomfortable watching it. Wow. But uh, it was really, really, really strange experience. We actually had a, a question in the um – one of the chat rooms. What what did they say, Jason? From Seeker. Uh, is that the one you want? Yeah. Uh, were there any reports of certain smells during during the sightings? Uh, of which location? Um, I don't know. It don't say. <laughs> I I'll guess. Tell funny, I'll tell you a really funny story about smells. I was at Ripa Villa. It was the place in Spring Hill, Tennessee, just south of Franklin, where. I told you that the Army of Tennessee, the uh, federal soldiers walked right past them in the middle of the night. Well, that's an old, it's an old house there where some of the people camped out on the lawn, but it's an old haunted house too. Well, I took a tour with a friend of mine. He was retiring. He was, it was the last tour, and I wanted to be on it. So I was there. I hung out with, the, with him for a little bit, and we talked. I took the tour, and there's a local college nearby, and to get college credits, you have to go take a tour of the house. So one of the little uh, co-ed girls, she was a real pretty girl, probably 19, 20 years old. She was on the tour and she's very attractive. So we're walking around the tour and the whole time we're on the tour, I kept smelling her, what I thought was her perfume. Mm. And it got stronger and stronger throughout the tour. And so finally the tour is over. So my buddy, I said, man, that girl's perfume about knocked me down. He said, Alan, that wasn't hers. That's the lady of the house. Anytime there's a pretty female here, she feels threatened and she makes sure her presence is known. So that was really, really cool and really kind of wow. weird. Wow, that is crazy. Yeah. <laughs> That's crazy. I know, um, you know, the wife and I also went to uh, the Winchester house. Um, I'm a truck driver yeah. by trade, so well, my wife my wife is too, I guess. But um, we, we team drive, or we used to. She doesn't anymore since I've purchased my own truck and, and uh, started that business up. But... Um, but we went to the Winchester Mystery House and did. They had two different tours of of the whole house because one tour did so many rooms, and then the next tour did the other, you know, the rest of the rooms. And it was just after the movie, so we weren't allowed to take pictures of inside the house at that time. We could only take pictures of outside the house, which really sucked. But um, you got a few ghost stories that you could get out of the people, like um. That was going to stop the second ghost story or the ghost tour or the tour period. It wasn't really a ghost tour. It was just a tour of the house. And um, because people, people are crazy, but there was one of a kind wallpaper up in the house um, and people were taking knives and cutting pieces of it and taking it home. Mm. And, um, but the funny part of that is, is that people started getting haunted by it literally like stuff would start happening crazy at their house and they would send letters back with those pieces of, uh, uh, of wallpaper and stuff saying, please, you know, take this back. We're sorry we took it. Um, and, uh, and hopefully this, you know, the, the haunting stops at our house, um, multiple times. Uh, and, and, you know, that's about the only thing you could get out of them from the Winchester house. But, but you know, that was, that was pretty, pretty fantastic. I went there back, I guess it's 2010, 2011. It's been almost 10 years ago, probably. But when I was there, they, they, they didn't really talk about the ghost stuff. And you can you get a few things. That girl told me that she got something playing with her hair one night or something like that. But they, were, they kept trying to upsell me because I went there in the day. Like, yeah, if you want to come back at night, we'll tell you the ghost stories. You ghost to They kind of kept it separate. They wouldn't tell you anything. But they did let me take pictures inside the house, which was nice. But um, yeah, it, it kept, I guess it's a business strategy back then they used. Yeah, we we got there. We went right after that la- that movie was made, and um, and so it was still under contract, so we couldn't take anything on the inside. But they they were a little more forthcoming as far as some ghost stories, but you know they really didn't get into into major details or nothing like that. Uh, like kind of like the movie did a little bit more, but 
Yeah, I haven't seen the movie. I kind of want to, but again, you know, I kind of know the real story, so maybe I shouldn't watch it. I will say that it's it's okay. <laughs> the real story, I think, is better, but um, the movie isn't bad. Um, it doesn't really do the actual story, you know, any justice, but, you know, anytime you give, I guess, Hollywood the rights to do stuff it 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 really isn't going to turn out exactly like you think it should so um i i will say that it is better than the 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 bell witch movie <laughs> I'll yeah, say, the I'll movie say much yeah the the bell witch i was so excited about it and it 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 disappointed me so bad on on what they did with it so did you ever did you get to watch the bell witch movie yeah, it was years ago. I barely yeah. remember it being. Yeah. It wasn't very, that's what I recall. Well, it wasn't accurate by any means, and yeah, uh, and, a little shaky to me. Well, the re- the reason that they they said that she was haunting was not even the real reason either, and and that was one thing that's that really, Hollywood. That was one thing that really bugged me the most about it. You know, was. There's a whole reasoning behind it. I know when you, you wrote this book, uh, Ghost of Gallatin, um, you done, I want to commend you on on some of the proceeds went to a place called Ashley's Place. Yeah, and I've tried to get back, and I've done events all over Gallatin for different charities, nonprofits. You know, everybody was so good to me here. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, at the time I lived in Nashville, now I do live in Gallatin. You know, I was just a stranger coming up here, just talking to people randomly and going to the business and asking them questions. And everybody was so kind to me. And um, actually, I wanted to give back to the community. And I found the charity to work with. I worked with them the first year, and then I've worked with several others uh, since. And there's a place called Trousdale House, or Trousdale Place, I'm sorry, up on Main Street. And it was owned by a former governor of Tennessee. And it was closed for years. I didn't include it in the books. I didn't get in there. It's owned by the uh, Daughters of Confederate Veterans. Mm-hmm. Or no, the Daughters of Confederate Revolution is what it's owned by. And the lady who ran the house, she lived, I think, out of the state. And I chased her for six months. I finally just gave up. I didn't include it. But um, there may or may not be a sequel to the book coming out that I maybe may or, not be, may or may not be working on. But um, <laughs> I started doing tours this year. And I got to be friends. With the, they have new ownership there, new leadership. And I got to go in there and experience a bunch of things. I brought my friend who's in path up at the house with me. And uh, we uh, did, did the ghost tours in Gallatin. And the people taking pictures. And, I've seen some really creepy things in the window and seen like a white mist on the stairs and people have seen curtains being pulled back. And I mean, it's just a whole lot of weird things happen in the house. I'm, I'm trying to work with them, help them raise money next year so they can be open like a regular historical house. But right now they're really hurting for funds. And mm-hmm. uh, Rosemont's got a location uh, down the street. is owned by Josephus Conn Guild. He was a, uh, a judge. He was buddies of Jackson and, Johnson and Polk, the three presidents from Tennessee, but actually he was buddies with Johnson, but Johnson hadn't thrown in jail uh, for some of his views back during the war. Went to Mackinac Island, Michigan, to a prison for a while. But um, the house is extremely haunted. Uh, actually, you know, I've done this for several years. I've never seen a ghost. Well, back in the springtime, I went to see my cousin, who was the director there, and I walked around back to see if his car was there, and I didn't see it. But I glanced over to the reception area, which was an old, it was an old garage back in, I guess, the 20th century. Now it's a big banquet hall. Well, I looked in the window, I saw a guy in a fedora. And I kind of, I was like, what? And I looked back again, he was gone. So I messaged my cousin. I said, please tell me I'm crazy. But there's a guy in a fedora in the reception area. I swear to you, I saw him, but now he's gone. And he messaged me back. He's like, yeah, that's that Squire, Squire Guild. They say that uh, back in the 80s, he would go there to watch UT football or he would uh, go there to hang out when his wife was having banquets and balls. He's kind of a just a regular guy, and he didn't really like all the high society stuff, and that's where he escaped to, and I guess that's where he is now. But I'd never seen a ghost until last spring, and I saw it there at Rosemont. Mm, that's pretty cool. Um, I've seen – I started seeing ghosts uh, at the age of three. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> seeing them, seeing them, like – they would actually come and wake me up at three o'clock in the morning. Um, and, uh, so that's why we're me and David's different. He's sort of sensitive and I, I haven't seen a thing. Yeah. Yeah. The only evidence I get is through, uh, mechanical 
scientific stuff. Yeah. Some folks are more in tune with it. I mean, like the empath, my friend, I mean, she's, God, she, the thing she can, she says she doesn't see them, she feels them and senses them. Uh, but I, I don't have that gift. So it just, some people have it, some folks don't. It, you know, it's kind of like, you know, playing the guitar. Some people are Eddie Van Halen and some people, you know, are like me, I guess, you know. <laughs> but, me. you know, some people can write like crazy. Yes. Like you. Yeah. And some people can just scribble. Yes. That, that's right. the difference. Yeah. No, I'm just, you know, I just enjoy the history, man. Like, I like some of my movies. I'm like, I ain't watched movies in forever. Like, I, I'll sit here, like I told you, I was reading articles about dueling in the 1800s, you know, to the chagrin of my wife. And <laughs> earlier today, I was reading the newspapers from 1863, reading about how prostitution became legal in Nashville. You know, stuff like that. Uh, really intriguing. Really? That's, that's crazy. Well, they had to. You know, the Union occupied Nashville, and all those soldiers were getting bored. So all these saloons and taverns, they made prostitution legal, and, you know, it, they got the soldiers. They got the soldiers' money, and it relieved some of the soldiers of some undue stress they had. And just huh. everybody won in the end. Yeah. Wow. That's yeah. that's something I didn't know about. Yeah, the histories are really draws me in. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm the same way. I I like the history first, and then uh, and then you know, if there's ghost stuff attached to it, then I'm you know I'm really all in then, but. Uh, history. I've been a history cra- crazy about history my whole life, and uh, and so yeah, I don't know history. When it comes to history, I'm I'm nuts because <clears throat> I'll do the same thing. I'll be sitting here and reading something about it, and then I'll tell my wife and stuff, and she's like, "Oh yeah, yeah, that's cool." And then she turns away and starts doing something else. <laughs> <laughs> when I when I researched this Franklin book, uh, you know, you know these old squares, these old towns, you know, pretty much every other building was a saloon, you know, and upstairs they had brothels and gambling. I mean, it just these squares now you have businesses and restaurants and bars, but back then, man, it's just it was it was literally the Wild West. Yeah, like in the Franklin book, I have store. The thing I love is the shootouts in the street because it happened all the time. Um, it just. Uh, there, God, it just, there's so many shootouts and Bob West. I mean, I was reading some about Franklin in 1804 where they had bears and coyotes walking through the town square. It's just, and you see all this stuff in Arizona and New Mexico, but Middle Tennessee, I guess East Tennessee, it was the same way for a certain amount of time until, you know, progress and all these fancy buildings got built. Right. Yeah. Um, we kind of had the, <clears throat> excuse me, the same thing in like the old city in Knoxville back, you know, back in the day where you had shootouts and, and all kinds of things going on. And, and, uh, and it was, it was pretty cool. I, I've got a book by, um, what's that guy that used to do the, um, Heartland series, Bill Landry. Beer Landry. Yep. I've got one of his last books. Um, we was at, um, an Indian, uh, powwow thing, uh, that goes on here all the time. And, um, it's actually a, a a festival that they put on every year for a harvest festival. And um, we go to it. We try to go to it every single year. And he was there two years ago, I think it was. It wasn't this year. It was last year. And uh, he had a new book that was out. And it was when the, the uh, East Tennessee was the Wild West. When East Tennessee was the West. This is as far West as the civilized nation had had come as far as the U.S. And, it was so far North Carolina back then. Yeah, and I'll tell you, uh, it's it's pretty fascinating, you know, um, where Fort Loudon was was I mean that was pretty much the boundary, and and uh, you know the shootouts and and the the Indian raids and all the things that went on. It was it was pretty neat, you know, um, and I didn't know that part of history as far as our area. And um, I knew that they, the Cherokee, you know, was here in East Tennessee, Georgia, North Carolina, you know, this whole area and stuff. But I really didn't know the history of this area. And, well, Middle Tennessee, it was founded because of the American Revolution. You know, the country or the young uh, blossoming country, they they wanted to challenge England and you know become a and get rid of the colonies and become some separate country. They had to entice soldiers to fight, 
And of course, they didn't have the money to do that. So the thing they had an abundance of, abundance of was land. So if you would come and fight for the colonies against the crown, you, know, you would get you know like 40 acres or 200 acres, whatever it was they gave you, it, it was to the West. You know, that's how Nashville, Summer County, Davidson County, and eventually like Nashville and Memphis was founded because all the land they had to give away to the soldiers who volunteered to, to fight for freedom or for independence. Mm. Yeah, that's, I don't know. I was, I was pretty fascinated with, with, you know, that bit of history. Cause I was, I was ignorant to it. You know, um, I guess, I guess I could say that, um, grow, growing up, I, I won't say I grew up here cause I've grown up in, in a million other places, but <laughs> yeah, I did. But I came here when I was 15 and, uh, and in school and stuff here, you know, they don't really teach you your local history. And I think that it, you lose out by not being taught these, you know, these, these, this local history. And, um, it's, I guess it's a lost art. Yeah. Well, I mean, the schools are the curriculum. That's terrible. Yeah. The history, the history I learned is not the history that I've researched. Right. It's like, I like to mention earlier, you know, you know, the good guys, they were bad. Yeah, you didn't want to free the slaves. But man, it's so complex. Like here in Nashville, there's a big hubbub about Nathan Bedford Forrest. He had a statue of his. It was really an art piece. It got taken down, and people are all up in arms about it. But the more I researched Nathan Bedford Forrest, that guy, I mean, you can't defend being a slave trader. And, you know, it, and the, the slant on being a Confederate general is bad right now. But that guy was fascinating from what he did. He went in as a private, but as a major general. You know, he would go up against the guys from West Point. And he kicked their butt every time. It's amazing because he, he never had the numbers. Like when he uh, he stormed the square in Murfreesboro, what happened was the Union came in to uh, Manchester, Tennessee, uh, a little south of Murfreesboro, and took 100 men to show a force. Marched them to Murfreesboro and threw them in jail. Just to, you know, send a message, hey, we're here, you're occupied, we're in control. Mm-hmm. Well, some of the women got word to Forrest, who was camping in the area, and then he got his cavalry together, and he uh, marched down Main Street, or they rode down Main Street, and when they got to the square, the Union set the jail on fire. So, you know, forces and his men battle it out there on the square. Forces the men get to the, the, the jail. They get the men out for it. Burns down. They save them all. And then uh, he takes the square. But he's not number three or four to one. But he used the buildings to camouflage his numbers. So when he got there at the courthouse in the middle of the, the uh, square, he has his men all on the road. And so the Union general looks around. He's like, oh, God, I'm surrounded. You know, he was, he had the numbers, but he just looked around and saw that he was surrounded by all the big buildings and the men in the street and thought he was done for. And really, he would have fought, he would have easily won. Forrest did the same thing in Mississippi, except this time he's on number like 16 to 1. But he tricked this guy into surrendering by running his men around in circles. So, like, he thought all these guys, all the guys saw was all these circles, all these uh, soldiers, you know, just just running around him. He thought he was done for. And so, when they went back to Forrest's tent to discuss the surrender terms, he looks around and like, hey, give my sword back. We're going to fight. And Forrest's like, no, man, sorry, you're done for. I mean, yeah. Forrest, he was a fascinating, like I said, it's, it's a lot of gray, but he was a fascinating guy. And he did a lot of things that a lot of guys couldn't have done, especially with the numbers that he didn't have. Right. And, and he was just doing, I don't know why he so hated today, because he was doing what he believed well, in. Well, suppose he was the founder of the KKK. And I, I don't think he was the founder. I think they said he was like a member. It, and it's so complex. It's so long ago. No one really knows. But like the title Grand Dragon, it comes from Nathan Bedford Forrest, you know, the, the Grand Wizard, yeah. because he was known as a wizard in the saddle. You yeah. know, and, and like I said, you can't defend being a slave trader. and You can't defend being the KKK. It was just, but the things he accomplished, just strictly from his military career, right. it's unparalleled. Uh, General Sherman, he told a reporter at the end of the war, or no, during the war, it was worth bankrupt, bankrupting the United States Treasury to kill Nathan Bedford Forrest. They mm-hmm. asked Grant after the war, who was the best soldier you know, that you ever had the privilege of uh, commanding? He said, I can't tell you, but I can tell you, the other guy on the other team is Forrest. It's like, uh, I was talking to somebody the other day about it. Uh, I, I know you guys know James Franklin is, but you think football fans? Yep. The coach at Vanderbilt who always beat Tennessee? Yes. Like Vanderbilt knows who beat UT, but James Franklin did it. Forrest was, was James Franklin. You know, he had... Didn't have the resources, didn't have the men, but he beat UT almost every single time. That's what Forrest was. Hmm. Okay. Did you ever run across uh, a 
a, I guess he's a general named Longstreet. Uh, William Longstreet? Yes. Yeah, I've heard the name. I'm trying to figure out where I've heard him from. I know the name. Uh, he he actually came through Loudon, and there was a battle or a skirmish here in Philadelphia, Tennessee, which is part of Loudon County. It's just, you know, right down maybe seven miles yeah. from the city of Loudon. But they fought over this uh, railroad bridge here. And it's it was pre- it's a pretty interesting story. I mean, I don't know a lot about it, but I've just from what I've heard from from our history buff, Mister Bo Carey. Yes, uh, he he uh, he done a lot of things here in Loudon. Yeah, I mean railroads and the waterways. I mean that's you know back in the eighteen hundreds, that's how you got men. It's how you got resources and supplies to troops. That's why Nashville is so integral. Because, you know, we had the Cumberland River, and we had all these railroads. That was a huge railroad hub. And like I said earlier, they're trying to get to, to Atlanta. You know, so they actually they wanted to get from Nashville to Murfreesboro to Chattanooga to Atlanta. And that's why there were three battles in Murfreesboro. And then, you know, Chattanooga had a whole bunch of battles in skirmishing. Because they were trying to divide the Army in two. Because you divide and conquer and you win. That's what they did. So it's the Union. They pulled it off. I mean, it wasn't easy, but they, they did what they wanted to do. Hmm. Yeah, I know um, that was the same thing like <clears throat> during um, when we had our little thing that we did on, on Halloween as far as walk around and, and had that the ghost tour and stuff here in Loudoun. One of the things that we, we learned during that that I didn't know was, you know, all we had at that time here was a ferry. There's no bridge to for people to go across. And so this town started growing faster than most towns in the state of Tennessee. And it was getting huge. <clears throat> and um, after they built it, you know, it kind of went back to, to Mayberry. And uh, and and people moved on up in, into Knoxville and, and stuff like that. But, um, you know... At that time, you know, there was a, a lot of stuff in this area that happened, you know, with, you know, the troops and stuff moving through with the ferries and, 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 um, they said that there wasn't a train bridge that crossed the Tennessee right here and that they would have to take stuff off and go across the ferry with it. And so that was another reason that, that the, the town grew so much. Um, because this was the last stop on the train ride, even uh, going, you know, from from the south as far as Georgia and stuff like that up. So that you know, that's a I don't know. It, to me, it's it's really fascinating to know, you know, with these movements of troops, with these movements of all this stuff into these areas, and train stops and starts and and and. Um, how that affected where they where they fought, you know, and and what happened, and and uh, how some of these towns grew, and um, even the fact that you you get these ghost stories out of these towns now because, you know, like here in Loudon, um, we have a few places that are pretty haunted, and it's because at some point they were used as hospitals or. Or other things during those times, you know. Yeah, it's funny, Mister Ferry. Like I've researched, like Nashville and Franklin and other places around here. Burning bridges was a big thing, you know. When you're occupied, you know, the citizens, they, you know, they probably had somebody fighting for the Confederacy, you know. And those soldiers were taking their crops and taking their their food, and sometimes kicking them out of the house. Or uh, I've heard instances where they would charge the people rent to live in their own houses. You know, it's just. It was kind of a really rough time back then. Like I said, war was hell. But um, burning bridges was something they would do. You know, the, soldiers, the citizens would get mad. They'd burn their bridges just so the guys couldn't come into their town or just to make it hard on them. I know they did it in Gallup and then in Franklin, Nashville. That was something people did. I guess you can't really burn a ferry, but you can burn a bridge. I guess you could burn a ferry, but it's easier to burn a bridge. Yes. Yeah. Now, um, with all the things that you've investigated, and over the time that you've done this, have you ever come across anything that you've just been like, that's scary. Uh, that's, that's just, uh, 
I don't want to use the word demonic because I think it's overused and I don't think that everything that happens that's mean or, or, or not good is demonic. But have you ever come across anything that was just where you was just well, going, I told you, oh, I mean, man, this is bad. It happened in a bunch of places. And I, was, I told you, I count three fingers. There were places I've been where something means going on. One is the Maryland Manor in Brentwood. Uh, it's now a restaurant. A girl, a girl told me she went down to the wine cellar and came back up and felt like she had a bee sting on her neck. She went to the bathroom looked in the mirror and there was a tic-tac-toe sign where something with two fingers had scratched her Ooh. on her neck. Um, the other place is over in the mansion in Murfreesboro. They say that uh, Lady of the House, Sally Maney, uh, her husband fathered some children uh, with the slaves, some mulatto children. And when cholera hit, it killed all her children. But all the mulatto children that her husband had fathered, they were fine. So they say that she's there, and they say that she's pushed people on the stairs, and women there get uncomfortable. And, you know, it's just some bad things have happened, supposedly. Um, but the, the, the most haunted place or the most things that are going on that's kind of mean or evil would be Cragfont in Castilla Springs, Tennessee. That was one of the first settled, or the first settled areas in Sumner County, which was uh, one of the first places established from North Carolina into the new Tennessee area. Um, it was founded by James Winchester. He was an American Revolutionary soldier who got a land grant. Him and his brother and his family came out here and settled, built this big house called Crag Font. Well, his brother was um, scout by an Indian. You know, and there's there's Indian mounds all over Stephen Springs. You know, you're close to his house, in fact. But um, the story there is that uh, Mr. Winchester, he's a very prominent individual. His house was a huge house. It was a boarding house. It was the post office, you know, back in the frontier days, you know, if you had a big house, you know, people traveling west would come stay with you. Mm-hmm. Well, he had a daughter who was autistic or she had special needs. And being a very prominent individual, that was very shameful. So when people came to the house, which is often, he would take her to the, to the attic. And some say they chained her up. Some say he would have a slave watcher. Well, that went on for many years. And the tale goes that uh, after a visit, she wound up being pregnant while the slave was watching her. So when that happened, she gave birth. They say that somebody in the Winchester family, possibly James Winchester, uh, he took the baby downstairs to the cellar and killed it. And he took the slave and threw him off a cliff. So just, but it's all hearsay. No one knows for, for sure what happened, but there's something mean in that house. Like I've seen security footage of the caretaker uh, having books thrown at him. Uh, it was on the news here in Nashville. He's walking up the stairs, and the door off of a clock fell and hit him in the nose and cut his nose real bad. Uh-huh. Uh, this weird thing always happened. I was there one day, and um, I think the house was closed for tours. I was talking to one of the gardeners, just making small talk, and I hear this boom, like literally like a grenade went off coming from the cellar from the basement there. And I said, ma'am, did you hear that? And she kind of just kept working. She's like, yeah. I said, I'll go with you if you want to check it out. And she looked at me just like nothing. She said, oh, honey, happens all the time. It's not a big deal. <laughs> I was like, how can you explain the explosion that you just heard? And she's, it just it wouldn't be doing her. Um, but I also went back another time. I was up in the attic where, uh, not the attic, but another part of the house where the children, yeah, because it was the attic, uh, where the children played and were kept. And uh, I was like, yeah, nothing's going on the people today. Let's get out of here. And as soon as I said that, I heard like a tick, like something like a rock being thrown against a wall. And so I asked Lady, I said, did you hear that? And she started down the stairs. She came back up. She's like, yeah, where'd it come from? And I pointed from where I heard the noise. And as soon as I pointed from where the noise was coming from, it started happening on the other side of the room. So something up there, possibly a child, was just was being funny, trying to, you know, just to be mischievous. Mm-hmm. But I've heard a lot of stories about that house, and people have seen people in the windows and, uh, I've heard stories about wedding events and uh, they're coming the next morning and all the decorations are just trashed. Uh, I've heard a lady tell me she went there to set up for uh, some kind of a Sumner County meeting for the county and a storm rolled in and she went downstairs and went to her car to come back to get something and it started thunder and she went back to, to uh, the room she had set up and all the chairs had been turned to face the window where the storm was rolling in. Just weird things like that always happen in the house. Hmm. Oh, that's yeah, that's crazy right there. That's, um, I don't know. <laughs> when you're talking about, you know, I've been scratched before and, um, and that's something by itself, you know, when, 
<clears throat> when you've had that happen to you, you're like, you know, there's no one around me and I just got scratched and then whelps start actually pulling up where, where the thing scratched you. You know, uh, there's no way to explain it. And uh, I think that some of these things do it for um, to try to, to try to instill fear. And um, I'm, I'm I really think that a lot of a lot of the things that happen like that that a lot of people call demonic. I honestly believe that it's um, I don't know. I'm going to get your attention. Uh Oh, yes. Well, and I think that it, it feeds off that, off the fear and, and it feeding off the fear. I I call it a, a, a tick, you know, a, a, um, a parasite and, um, and these things, that's what they feed off of. And if you don't, if you deny them that fear, then they go on somewhere else. And, um, and so, you know, that's just from someone who, you know, that I've been dealing with, with a lot of this stuff since I was three and, and I can't say any more than anybody else as far as <laughs> what's going on, you know, and, uh, but, you know, I just feel that some of these, some of these entities actually feed off that fear and, and, uh, when they do these things to try to frighten you, to they scratch you, they push you, they they pinch you, they pull your hair, they do all these things, and and I feel that it, it's trying to elicit that that effect of of fear from you, and if you deny that to them, then then they go elsewhere. Well, I got a similar story. Um, when I was working on the book, I was, I was walking down the square with the empath I was talking about earlier. And there's no boutique, and the story is a lot of those buildings uh, on the square on North Water were burned down numerous times. The story is there are, there are several brothels up there, and I've actually been in one of the buildings where they were renovated, and you can see the little 10 by 10 partitions where I could, you could tell it was a brothel where there were like little rooms where the women worked. Well, they say that the uh, brothels burned or the, the buildings burned down, and supposedly some of the women workers had children. Well, the stories in a lot of those buildings are they hear children running back and forth and giggling and playing upstairs in the second floor. So we go to this one place, it was a boutique, and we get to the top of the stairs, and the empath sticks out her hand with like her palm down, like something's holding her hand, and she just takes off running. I said, what are you doing? She said, there's a little girl here, she wants to show me something. So uh, I said, okay, so I walk over to where she's standing, and she's kind of just like, just kind of looking around, like I guess the little girl uh, had walked away for a second, and um she, I said, well, what's going on? She's like, well, she just wants to show me something. I said, okay. I said, well, have her take my hands. She goes, she can show me too. So as soon as I said that, I reached down and started scratching the palm of my hand. And she looked at me and she's like, Alan, she's holding your hand. So it, it could have been a coincidence or maybe a little girl was holding my hand when I was scratching my hand. I, it just, it was really weird how it was like bang, bang, how it happened. So I, I, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, um, I'm, uh, I'm my whole life, just because of what's happened to me my whole life and what I, what I've been able to see and, and, and feel my life. I've always known that these things were real. Now, (laughs) you know, what's funny about that is, is that a lot of people throughout the years, even when I was younger, you know, look at you and, and kind of roll their eyes, uh, because, you know, it definitely wasn't mainstream for a long time. And, uh, and then now that it is mainstream, people kind of look at you funny and just like, well, are you just trying to get attention, you know? And, um, but, but for me, when you get those kind of affirmations, uh, you know, just weird things happening like that, the spirit world world is real and, and, um, you know, there's nothing that, that anybody could tell me anyway, that, that could, you know, deter me from believing that. And, uh, but, you know, again, like you were saying earlier, not everybody can see and not everybody under can, can hear. Cause I don't, I don't hear them. I'm, I'm, I'm definitely not able to, you know, auditorial aud- auditorially hear them uh, talking or anything like that. But I've definitely been able to see them my, most of my, my whole life, you know? And, um, yeah. But 
so without that, you know, other people are, I guess, running on faith, I guess. And uh, for me, being able to see them my whole life is is I'm working on the fact that, hey, that's just nothing new, you know. <laughs> but when you could back it up, when when you felt something and, and she was sitting there telling you, hey, she's holding your hand, you know. It, it reminds me a lot of like when that little girl was sitting on Jason's lap and he asked her and she said, yes. <laughs> and, and that wasn't just the end of that. He uh, told it to stop and it, and it stopped on cue. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, okay, it's enough. Uh, you could go, go do something else now. And the, you know, the EMF and everything just went. Phoop, and that's dead. when I said, okay, <laughs> uh, I got to go home. Well, we we listened to the to the EVPs, but yeah. After the EVP, <laughs> yeah. I said I got to go home. <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> I know. Um, on your book, Franklin, Tennessee, um, did you write about the Ten Cottage? Uh, yeah. Um, the lady there, Marianne, she's really sweet. She's done that kind of things, and her husband showed me a video of a wagon that just rolls me a few feet into his leg just out of nowhere, having on Halloween of all days to happen. Yeah, it, it, all those shops, it's the same thing in Franklin. They see things, hear things. And it's funny, some of them have the same stories. Like from, you know, eight to five business hours, nothing goes on. They're like, seven, eight o'clock, if you're there past the business hours for a couple hours, they, they'll start knocking things off on the floor. They'll start making noise. Like it's time for you to go. <laughs> it's like eight to five, it's yours. But after that, it's ours. So it's, have the same story everybody has on the square there yeah well there was one story i was wanting to ask you about it's called it's about crayons yeah it was actually on the news i think yeah she told me it's in the book um she had some uh, crayons from carabas an italian restaurant here in middle tennessee it's i think it's a chain but uh it's like children you know, bring you the menu the children's menu you get crayons with it well she brought them home and she took them to the restaurant or took them to her shop and she put them somewhere and they kept coming up missing so she'd find them, and then they come missing again. Well, she took them out and put them, I think, in the trash, or she put them somewhere. They can know them would ever find them. Like, the next day, they had found them, and then it's just, uh, it's the thing, like, when I interviewed her for the book, she's like, yeah, she's like, they're missing right now, but I know they're going to turn back up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. That's, that's but the coolest fantastic. story about Franklin. The coolest story I found about Franklin is not a ghost story. Uh, back in 18... 18- was it 31 when Mary Shelley, Mary Shelley published the book Frankenstein over in uh, the UK or Europe or it was all these doctors and scientists started trying to figure out ways to about dead bodies. Oh. So there was a guy from Pennsylvania named Dr. Ferdinand Stith. He actually had an office for the courthouse. He's now right there on the square. <laughs> and he made a deal with a slave who was going to be hanged because, you know, what the slave have, to do, have, have left to lose, you know, Hey, bring me back. Okay. Well, I made you up the slave, you know, if, when you die, I get your remains, and I'll take you back to my office, and we're going to try to revive you. Mm. So he did. The sheriff accompanied him, took the, the remains to his office, put the electric current to his temple, and he got his muscles switching. And, you know, he tried to perform some experience, get him going, but eventually the sheriff's like, okay, that's enough, let him go. And the body wilted away and died. But uh, Dr. Stith, he was all, it's called galvanism. He used electric current to move the muscles and make uh, everything twitch. But he was a he was a firm believer in that, and a lot of folks tried that back in eighteen thirties. That was you know it was science fiction, the first science fiction book ever published. But um, he after that he bought I think it was a sheep with one eye. And he would show it to people. He was a really odd guy, but he you know he tried to buy bodies out of sheep with one eye. What kind of creepy guy is that? <clears throat> What's really funny my, though, and my mother's in my attic. <laughs> What's really, <laughs> what's really funny about that, though, is his last name, Stiff. I, I, it's T-I-T-H. Okay, so Stiff. Yeah, okay. not Stiff. Not the first guy who's thought that. Yeah, I'm I was a, like, I'm what? A, I'm amazed by, by these history lessons. Where do you find these things? Man, just, I'll go to the archives. I'll go to the library. I love to read all newspapers. You uh, can learn so much. And that's where I kind of like the whole civil war thing I was telling you about, you know, it's so much way there. Like when I first did the Gallatin book, I had that, that mindset of, Oh yeah, the union of the good guys. And you start reading all these people writing letters to the paper, like Forrest, please save us from these devils, hmm. you know, cause they would come and just take their crops, take their livelihood away from them. Yeah. And I just read newspapers. You can learn 
so much that you don't really get taught in, in school because it's just like prostitution is being legal. I found that article. That was just really, really odd and really somewhat just really weird. But uh, just, you can learn weird facts like that and uh, just, I don't know. I, I, just, I just love researching history. It's, it's so fascinating. It's just it, back in the 1800s, it's just, it was a different way of life. And yeah. like I mentioned, shootouts and the wild, wild west. That's how it was back then. Well, I, I tell you what, it's amazing that you can you can actually find these things because it is very interesting to me, and I love listening to it. So um, I think we may have time for one more out of your book, one of your stories. You can pick whichever one you want to tell. Oh, God. Uh, why don't you ask me which one of my children are my favorite? Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to think. Oh, man. Uh, throw a topic at me. <laughs> um, let's take one out of your first book out of the series. The Gallatin? No, wait a minute. I'll take that back. The the hotels. Okay. Yeah, okay. Well, I went to New Orleans. See, yeah, I, I, tried, I, tried, I started writing about places that I really just have a lot of free time on my hands. Now, I just published the Gallatin book, and I've done a lot of travel. I've been to Savannah a bunch, and New Orleans, all, all these places where they had haunted hotels. And, uh, the last place in the book I, I did, it was in New Orleans. It's called the Magnolia Manor. Um, and back in the day, it was a big opulent house in the Garden District, right outside the French Quarter. Well, the story there is there are lots of folks who died in the house, but uh, they say there are kids who run around the halls and you hear them playing at night. So when I booked my stay, I got booked on the bottom floor. You know, they see all the activities on the second and third floor, the ground level, not so much. Well, around four in the morning, I had to go to the bathroom. I went to the bathroom, turned the light on, and I heard a, uh, like a kid. Uh, he goes, hey. And I'm kind of looking around thinking, okay, you know, it's, it's four o'clock in the morning. I'm sure it's got a family outside. They're checking out. You know, it's time for them to leave. So I walk outside, um, and I'm on the corner. There's nobody on the other side of me, just except for the courtyard. And there's nobody out there. No, everybody else is still asleep. So uh, I go back inside and I get my EMF meter out. Um, I'm kind of bumbling around because it's four o'clock in the morning. I go back in the bathroom and I hear a eh 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 like a skipping record. Hmm. It, it just and it just stopped. So uh, a few hours later, the uh, lady who runs the the house she came in. I was talking to her. I said, "You know, this happened to me last night." It's like, "Oh yeah, it's those kids are everywhere." I said, but I thought I was just the upstairs. She's like, oh, no, honey, they're everywhere. They play all the time. So it just that was kind of neat to have my own little experience there in New Orleans. You know, New Orleans, if you go to buy a house in New Orleans, there are signs that say, you know, for rent, for sale, and it will say not haunted. Because it's, it's assumed there in the French Quarter, everything is haunted. You know, two-thirds of the French Quarter burned down in the 1870s, 1890s. And it's just it's kind of like a given fact that everything there is haunted. Wow. I I've, I've, I've went down the French Quarter and uh my sister uh lives across like Pontchartrain over in uh Covington or Monroe County. So I've thought about this year going to New Orleans for a vacation or next year. Might see how that works out. She uh I just recently found out, you know, I haven't seen her since well, I hadn't seen her since I was about 7 or 8. And we just recently got in contact with each other. So we visited two or three times since then. But I'm thinking about going to New Orleans for my vacation next year. Yeah, New Orleans, it's a really neat place. And I think there's a lot of restrictions now uh, with the virus and stuff. And I ain't gone back the past two years because everything that's going on. I think the, the mayor's locked the city down from what I understand. But yeah, there's so much history there and from the War of 1812 and Civil War and all those fires that just ravaged the French Quarter, and it's just there's a lot of haunted history there in New Orleans. Yeah, yeah. New New Orleans does have a lot of history. Um, the wife and I have been have been there twice. Um, <clears throat> going on a uh, was going on cruises, and they were going out of out of uh, Louisiana, and so we'd go a day early. So we could spend some time in Louisiana and, and it was okay. Um, I'll tell you, beignets are good. <laughs> oh, they're great. <laughs> oh, you can get those. Don't call them. Now. Don't call them a, uh, a donut. Biscuit. 
they'll go crazy. Uh, uh. Yeah, my favorite story about New Orleans is not a ghost story. It actually really happened. During the War of 1812, you know, Andrew Jackson and his men were sent down there to protect the city of New Orleans from the British. Yes. Well, you know, because the British wanted to attack the port and, you know, invade from the south. Well, Jackson made some deal with some privateers, you know, to ambush the, yeah. the English Lafitte. army. John Lafitte. Yep. Lafitte. Well, Lafitte. when he did that, he declared, he declared martial law and locked down the city and imposed a curfew. Well, I, they didn't sit well with a lot of people in New Orleans. So people, somebody wrote a letter to the editor of the main newspaper there and said, hey, what Jackson's done is illegal. You know, we need to be free. Do what we want, blah, blah, blah. So Jackson goes to the newspaper office the next day and demands to see the editor. And he gets the editor's office like, you know, who wrote this? He's like, well, I can't tell you that. Like, well, you're going to tell me or I'm going to kill you. So he tells him. So Jackson goes to the guy who wrote the article and turns out he knows it. So he threw the guy in jail. Well, a judge issued a decree saying, hey, Jackson, you got to let him out. That's illegal. So Jackson got the judge, the guy with the letter, walked him to the outsource of New Orleans, New Orleans and said, you see his line? You don't come back. I mean, Jackson, he was a fascinating guy. I mean, he's kind of like Donald Trump or Donald Trump. You love him and you hate him, but, you know, he stood by his convictions. Yeah. <laughs> but they said that if, uh, if it wasn't for Andrew Jackson, the people in New Orleans would be speaking English. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's funny. Yeah, we um, – we done a, a story about uh, John Lafitte and um, Andrew and Jackson, Andrew Jackson and, and stuff like that. Yeah, it was, it, you know, that was a pretty pretty fascinating thing to uh, to research and and do a story about. And um, uh, Lafitte himself was pretty pretty awesome. I mean, he even not only was he pretty much the king of that area, right? I mean, they come down and and ask him to help as far as, um, you know, with ships and stuff like that to help during that time. But then he also founded the city of Galveston, te- uh, Texas, you know, and, um, and which is pretty fascinating in its own, which he, he, he actually got kicked out of too, but, um, so, he's just a pirate. Yeah. Well, he was a privateer and, and a pirate and everything all together. So it was pretty crazy. I, uh, okay, if you have- you should look into Jackson and his history with dueling. He, I mean, Jackson, he was quick to get offended. He was thin-skinned. He was married to a lady who was previously married. Um, the lady he married was married to a guy in Kentucky, but he sent her away. And during that time, Kentucky broke off from Virginia. So when they got divorced, the the paperwork off in the shuffle when the states changed. They filed Virginia, but it should have been in Kentucky, so they never got divorced. But, so Jackson, he's rising in prominence. Turns out paperwork wasn't signed by a judge and He's married to a married woman, so his uh, his, his opponents would use that against him. Whereas a guy named Charles Dickinson, uh, they had a, a beef from a horse race where something didn't break right, and uh, he he was insulting Jackson. Jackson went back and forth. They had a duel, so they go to the dueling grounds there in Kentucky because uh, Jackson had to defend his wife's honor. And so his second, they're, they're discussing the whole way to the dueling ground. What should we do? And the second's like, well, you should have challenged him. He's like 4-0 and in duels. He's like the best shot in middle Tennessee. Like the guy, Dickinson on his way to Kentucky, he would shoot like in trees. Like he would, he would leave marks to intimidate Jackson, you know, to let him know that he was a good shot. So they get up there, him and the second, they come up with a game plan. And um, so the second's like, here's what you need to do. Just, you know, wear a big, thick coat, make yourself look bigger. And just when the signal's given – you stand there, and let him get the first shot because maybe he's going to be hurt and he might miss. So they get there, it's, you know, one, two, three, four, five, fire. And um, Jackson stands there, he doesn't shoot. Dickinson shoots, and he kind of he missed because the coat was really big and it kind of threw off where he was wanting to get. It hit him in the rib instead of his heart. So Jackson kind of took a step back, and Dickinson standing there like, oh, God, you know, did I miss? You know, I have such a good shot. So Jackson pulls up his gun, he pulls, he, uh, pull, he, he gets in his sight, and he pulls the trigger, click. He had a half cock where it wouldn't go. So Dickinson thinking the thing's over, and Jackson fills with his gun for a second and shoots the guy right there on the second shot. So there's a lot of controversy there. They say he killed a man in cold blood, or maybe it was justified. But you know, Jackson had several different duels. I mean, he was, just a, he was a badass. There's no way around it. Yeah. <laughs> that reminds me of a show I listened to last night. On Gunsmoke, I I like to listen to old radio shows, like from the forties and fifties. And uh, Matt had got shot in a in a duel or in a you know in a draw with a got shot in a, his gun arm. And uh, 
Well, he, a couple of weeks went by, it still wasn't getting no better. So he said, I got to go find this guy and I got to, I got to take care of him. He actually uses his left arm to, 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 uh, draw down on him. But the other guy didn't notice it, which way the gun was pointing until he actually got shot. So it, it was, it was about the same thing you're talking about now. It was, it was just a trick. Hmm. It was pretty good. I like it. Yeah, dueling, that was, that was a big thing. Like, if you were part of the upper crust here in, in Middle Tennessee, or actually pretty much anywhere, Memphis, uh, Alabama, Kentucky, you know, it was about honor, protecting your honor. Mm-hmm. You know, so if you're a rascal or a liar or a thief, you know, you, you could go, you could do it. You can do it in Middle Tennessee because it was illegal. I think in 1808, they, they made it illegal. But you go across the state lines of Kentucky, right there by the river, and you can do it. It's called the dueling grounds. I think now it's like a, a developed area called the Dueling Grounds Brewery, Dueling Grounds, this and that. But uh, back in the day, that's where you went to sell your differences. Hmm. That's pretty interesting. That, I, I just cool. wish I knew where your sources were because you got all kinds of information. It's, it's, I mean, I, I found something that I could send it to you, but it's put out by the state. I actually read about this other guy. He was uh, he actually issued a challenge to Jackson, and Jackson wouldn't accept it because he was a lower class. Uh, he'd huh. been in a duel before, he fired on two. And like he had no honor, but uh, he kept calling out Jackson. So one of Jackson's friends, John Coffey, he picked up the gun and said, "Hey, let's go. I'll, I'll, I'll duel you." So uh, they go, and then one, two, the guy fires on two again. So it was a big hubbub because that was the second time he'd shot before the signal was given. So he has to. Uh, the guy's like, "Okay, we're going to do to fix this." And so the uh, guy who fired on two said, "Okay, take a shot." But the guy's like, no, here's what we're going to do. You're gonna, we're going to go back to Nashville. You're going to write a letter to the editor, to the newspaper, and you're going to tell them what you did. You know, so he just killed the guy's career. Like, he was a joke the rest of his life. Yeah. But the guy maintained his honor because he showed up, and the guy cheated and tried to kill him. Wow. I'm going to have dreams about dueling tonight. <laughs> it, it's fascinating. It's all about your honor. That was the big thing back yeah. then. And where did yeah. that go? I mean, where? What happened? But they need to bring that back, yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> I say the, that. The world yeah. was so much simpler back in the day. If this is over, in send me your email ways. address. I'll send, I'll send you this article I found the other night that it's very intriguing, goes into great detail about dueling back in the 1800s. Oh, okay. Yeah, that 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 would be that'd be fascinating. I, I think you got her email address, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, email I think so. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, same place you emailed them, your bio and everything. So uh, we're about to the end of the show, which we're a little over, but that's okay. We got up to three hours. <laughs> um, uh, go ahead. You was about to say it. I was just going to tell him if he wanted to give out, yes. you know, all his information and wh- where they can his... buy your books. Oh, yeah. yeah, all the books are available on Amazon dot com. They're in a bunch of shops in Middle Tennessee, but uh, I think most of your listeners are probably uh, in West Tennessee or East Tennessee. Uh, yeah, I'm at Amazon.com is a place to get them. Um, yeah, I'm on SouthernGhostStories.com or Southern Ghost Stories on Facebook. I run a group called Tennessee Hines where I post ghost stories and events and investigations and stuff we do. But I'm pretty active on there, and I'm always working on stuff. So, yeah, just keep it with me on there. Now, was that TennesseeHauntings.com? No, it's SouthernGhostStories.com as a website, okay. but it's Tennessee Hauntings on uh, Facebook as a group I run. Okay. There's also a yes. Southern Ghost Stories Facebook page for, for the uh, – for the books and stuff, but yeah, um, yeah Tennessee Hauntings is screwed by really, and we, we're always doing stuff on there, especially it's kind of died off since October, but back in the spring when it gets warmer, we'll, we'll get it jumping again. Maybe we'll get some of our stories off there. That sounds good. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's awesome. We love Tennessee history. Yes. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> you know, um, that's one thing that, you know, I want more than anything is, is to get our, um, base out of Tennessee even bigger than it is already. And, um, and you know, stuff like this right here just, just helps it. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. I started the Tennessee audience group on Facebook last October, just for fun, just to post stuff. And like it had over, I think 13,000 people or almost 13,000 people in the first year. Whoa. Like it grew really fast. It's like, there's a lot of interest in stuff going on in Tennessee and it's, it's real, real encouraging and it's a lot of fun. Well, uh, have you have you got our page info for Facebook? Yeah, actually, you just I liked it. I guess uh, okay. We'll Jumped on the air here. We've got a couple of thousand. I mean, we're not thirteen thousand strong, but 
that's amazing. Yeah, that's that's freaking fantastic. That's fantastic. Um, but yeah, uh, I definitely want to thank you for um, again, like I said at the beginning of the show, you know, for coming on and and also with such uh, maybe, short notice. Maybe he can write some books about uh, East Tennessee and and include Loudon in it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I've got some stuff on the back burner. You never know. And actually, I actually had somebody the other day say, "Hey, what's about East Tennessee?" And poke around. I'm like, "Yeah, I've got a lot of my play here in Middle Tennessee, but you, you never know." Yeah, Middle Tennessee is very, very interesting. I didn't know it was as haunted in, until I started listening to you and uh, and the and the you know other shows that you've been on and stuff. And and um, I was. <laughs> I was pretty impressed. I was like, "Holy mo, holy moly!" I was like, "Well, it's funny. I didn't even talk about the uh, the battles of Native Americans here in Nashville. Oh, we do that, man, thing. that would be good. <laughs> good. That would be a, a second show for you. Yeah, they, Native yeah. American battles. Yeah, well, I'll come back on if you guys want me here. Oh, oh absolutely, love to have you on. Yeah, absolutely. It's been a yeah. great conversation. All right, thanks nice for having me on, guys. Well, um, Alan. I definitely want to thank you for coming on and, and doing this show. And like I've said several times in such short notice, I mean, cause I think we just asked you what at the beginning of the week, a week so, ago. Yeah. <laughs> to come on no and, uh, for you, for you to say yes and stuff, that's, that's fantastic. You know, we, we rarely get that. And, uh, and you know what, for you to be a Tennessee guy, that's, that's even better. Yeah, I mean, um, that that's rare for us. I don't think we have too many people in this Tennessee, area that we no. talk about. No, uh, East Tennessee, Bigfoot, Matt Seaver, yeah. uh, and you. That's that's about it. Well, so, we got um, we have old South Pittsburgh, old South Hospital. Pittsburgh Hospital and all the people who work there that we that's had that's been on the show. Yeah, yeah. but um, but besides well, that, I mean, now we got Middle East. We got Bow Carry for East Tennessee, and then yeah. we got. Uh, is Chattanooga, East Tennessee, or is that? Yeah, yeah. I guess it would yeah, be. Yeah, it would be. Uh, yeah. We got East the East. South Pittsburgh. Now we just need some West Tennessee stories. Oh, uh, well, we'll have to expand, I guess. But it's um, been a pleasure. I ha- know that it has been. I learned a lot. I'm a history buff. Jason loves history. And uh, we could just sit here and talk about history all night. So, <laughs> yeah, uh, not even the ghost stories, you know, just the history yeah, al- I, alone is just I like awesome. The, I like the the Native American that that you talked about that you're going to talk about on our next show. Next show, <laughs> with next you. show. Yeah. yes. So just think, everybody, you got to come back again for the Native. Just American to part. just to let me help me get studying on it. Uh, were they Cherokee or were they something else? Uh, here in Nashville, I think it was uh, there were three. There, there I think it was, was it Chickamauga, yep. Chickamauga, Chickamauga. Uh, I think Cherokee was one of them. There's one more, but I can't remember off the top of my head. It's in my notes. Is it? Huge? I got some on the back where I've been working on, and it's 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 all in there intertwined with that. Okay. But by the time I can talk to you guys again, I probably have it out. So okay. Yeah, that's awesome. All right, we're going to yeah. put your books on our website and uh, on Facebook, and and tell everybody to go go get them. Yeah, I, I'm definitely going to get them. Yeah. Now, this is a question for us here, for Jason and I. Is there a way that we could go through you and get them autographed? Yeah, we 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 we, we love autograph. collecting autographed books from from our guest. Yeah, I can get you some. Okay. We'll we'll uh, I, uh Jason will have more time. Then yeah, I will, just, but uh, just email me and I'll pay you for them and for PayPal or some way, and you can send them to us. Oh uh, yeah, we'll figure it out out there. Okay, awesome. Um, well, I want to I want to thank you uh, for coming on, and like I said a hundred times, I guess, but in such short notice and um, giving us this awesome history. And, uh, and, and a little ghost stuff in, in, in between. And, um, uh, I look forward to having you back on again. Oh yeah. And Jason, yeah, does too. and, 
thank you very much. And we will make sure that we put on your link as far as uh, in, in our website where people could get your books and uh, and find find your uh, all your information and I mean I just typed in on Google uh, Tennessee history mm-hmm. he pops up yeah that's fantastic yeah if you just want to search for Alan Searcy just just type in Tennessee history Alan Searcy I mean I mean it shows everything that that's pretty, that's pretty funny that's cool that's cool. Um, <laughs> that, that is pretty cool. Yeah. Um, so, uh, thank you. Thank you, Alan, for, for coming on. And, um, we really appreciate again, the short, short notice and, um, that you, you was able to be available and, and, um, we'll be in touch with you on the, definitely. the next show. Definitely. Uh, okay. Maybe a few weeks or, or maybe a month or so down the road. Yeah. All right. Yeah, guys, I really enjoyed it. Thanks for having me on. Awesome. You you have a good night, and um, we will definitely talk to you later. All right, guys. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Good night. Wow. He's a great guest. That was fantastic, man. I, I mean, like I was talking to my <laughs> uh, brother or, or just best friend. Yeah. You know, that's one thing I love about this show is that we we just have a conversation. And uh, we we don't do the question and answers. And did you find anything in in Franklin, Tennessee, <laughs> Mister <Mr>. Searcy? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, you know, that's the thing is that we we do this a little bit differently than everybody yeah, else. Yeah, it's just a conversation between good old boy. Well, I ain't gonna say good old boy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, some guys just talking about history and ghosts and, and stuff like that. Yeah. And you know, that's the great thing is that it's just a conversation. You get in on the conversation and you know, like you see tonight, if someone asks a question, Hey, you know what? We'll answer. Yeah. Come on to either Podbean, come on to Spreaker, come on to our website. Oh Fra- yeah. Paranormal 411. Now, I do, org. I do have some news. We're going to have a guest on in January. I don't know when, but his name is um, Daniel Jackson, and he does a podcast called uh, Beyond the Veil. That's a pretty and big podcast. He's a, Yeah, he's a psychic medium, and he's, he's really cool, and I like watching him, uh, but that's still in the mix. And next week we may not have a show because I've got some plays to go to for school. Oh, uh, well, well. So it might be after the holidays when when we when we do the two hour live show again. But we'll do some short shows in between. Yes, definitely, one hundred percent. Um, I want to say thanks everybody for coming on. Um, tonight we did talk to Al Alan Searcy, um, about his go uh, Southern Ghost Stories series of books and uh remember we do go live on spreaker and on pod bean but we are also live on our website paranormal411.org i want to thank all of our premium members and there's quite a few of them and um, special shout out to steve manser steve manser he did help us out with our new heck logo. of a job on the logo steve yes. we yep. really appreciate it thank you it. brother stay in touch man email me i I'm, i need to know what you're doing yeah how we, you're doing we we miss your emails you used to give us weekly e- emails and and they've gone away so but we do we do miss those emails and uh we do love all of our listeners every oh, yeah. one of you um, and, uh, we thank you for, for listening, um, for staying tuned in to what we're doing and, uh, we're actually doing great with this new, uh, name. We, we really are. I think it's allowed people to understand what we really talk about. Yeah. I mean, 
Project Dark Corona versus Paranormal 411 is, is a big difference. <laughs> it is. In name. It is. It is. And, you know, the thing is, is that Project Dark Corona was the first American spy satellite well. program. It served us well. The problem was, was the coronavirus and the corona in our name. Kicked in. Yeah. And uh, so we decided to rebrand. And I think the rebranding has done good. Yeah. And uh but I do want to thank everybody that that has uh sticked with stuck us stuck with us and and uh stuck with us. Yeah. <laughs> and listen to us and and um and everything. So uh, uh Jeff Reagan, if you're listening, if you're out there in La La Land <laughs> I don't know what happened to Podbean. Uh but I'm still waiting on the date and time for that bonfire. And the investigation of your wooded Woods. area. You know, and that new song. You've got to listen to it. I've heard it. Man, the new song. The new song. You will. You'll. You'll. Oh. I'm telling you, I can't wait till I get to play it. Well, why can't I hear it now? Have you heard it? Oh, I've heard it several well, why times. Why ain't I heard it? Because he's come here. Play it. <laughs> but, but he hasn't got it to where. Um, someone can't steal it from them yet. Oh, you know? okay. so, um, but yeah, the new song, when we do get to play it, I'm telling you, everybody's going to be woo about that new song. So, um, but thanks everybody for coming on, listening to us and, um, Alan Searcy, uh, this was a great show. Oh yeah. Definitely go visit him and, uh, buy some books. Because uh, that's fascinating. It is the way just the stories alone. The history, but the history. The paranormal. Yes, the history is just it's fascinating. I mean, the guy knows the uh, Middle Tennessee history. Yeah, big time. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. When he can talk about uh, Andrew Jackson's duels. Yeah, yeah. That's fantastic. Uh, the guy knows what he's talking about. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Um, so uh, I want to thank everybody. I know Jason does. Uh, we want to thank everybody for showing up, for listening to the show. And uh, have a good weekend. Have a, a, a very merry weekend. Yes. And if we don't talk to you, which we'll be on here before Christmas, but have a very happy holidays. Yes. And we will see you later. Uh, we got someone or something crawling around out here. Did you see what it was? Was it a person or an animal? Or I can't tell. All I know is that my central light came on, and I just happened to glance and see this thing running across the yard. Uh, a good-sized man or something looks like a man. I don't know what it was, just that it ran across the yard. Okay. You've had problems in the neighborhood before? Yeah, my dog was killed here just recently. I don't know what it was, whatever it is. It's running. I couldn't catch it if I was going to chase it. You're listening to Paranormal 411, coming to you live from an undisclosed location deep within the Appalachian Mountains, bringing you the unknown with your hosts, David Reagan and Jason Scott, Paranormal 411.